I was born February 12th, 1809, in Hardin County, Kentucky. Of course, when I came of age, I did not know much. I was raised to farm work, which I continued till I was 22. At 21, I came to Illinois. He entered adulthood poor and uneducated. Abraham Lincoln was skilled with an axe and knew how to shuck corn, but no one expected much from the farmer's son in tattered jeans and gaping shears. Lincoln surprised everyone, however, by parlaying brains and away with words into a political career for the ages. He was melancholy by nature, no stranger to nightmares and bouts of depression, but he was also the first humorist to occupy the White House and routinely infused speeches and conversation with jokes and anecdotes. He taught himself law, surveying too, and liked chess, Shakespeare, and the poetry of Robert Burns and Edgar Allan Poe. But Abraham Lincoln's first love was politics. He followed his heart early, running for state office at age 23. He lost but was elected two years later, going on to serve three terms in the Illinois legislature. People liked his unpretentious manner and appreciated the humor he brought to the stump. Lincoln liked being liked and worked tirelessly to secure a political future. His law partner, William Herndon, once called Lincoln's ambition a little engine that knew no rest. At 37, Lincoln was elected to the House of Representatives. By that time, he'd married a Southern belle from Lexington named Mary Todd. He'd met the future Mrs. Lincoln at a party where he said he wanted to dance with her in, quote, the worst way. Afterward, Mary told a friend he certainly did. Nevertheless, she was impressed. She liked the looks of her tall, dark suitor. If any personal description of me is thought desirable, I am in height six feet four inches nearly. Lean in flesh, weighing on an average 180 pounds. Dark complexion with coarse black hair and gray eyes. The couple wed in 1842 and quickly started a family. They had four sons, Robert, Eddie, who died as a toddler, Willie and Tad. Lincoln, meanwhile, continued to gain political influence and by the mid-1850s was regarded as a key player in the newly formed Republican Party. In 1858, he lost a Senate race to Stephen Douglas, but not before reminding spectators that a house divided against itself cannot stand. His eloquent articulation of Northern sentiment in a country poised for civil war earned him national recognition, and two years later, the Republicans nominated him to the presidency. He and his running mate Hannibal Hamlin were elected in 1860. Seven states had already seceded by the time of Lincoln's inaugural, and a month later, Confederate forces fired on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. The war consumed Lincoln's administration, and his moods blackened under the strain. Harshly criticized by both the people and the press, he often walked alone late at night to collect his thoughts, sometimes stopping to talk with strangers. Things were also dark on the home front. In 1862, the Lincoln's 11-year-old son, Willie, became ill and died. His parents were devastated, and Mrs. Lincoln's already fragile mental state deteriorated. Of their four sons, Lincoln called them his dear codgers, only one, Robert, lived to see adulthood. Americans re-elected Lincoln to a second term in 1864. A month into it, Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. Five days later, on Good Friday, Lincoln accompanied his wife to Ford's Theater to see a comedy called Our American Cousin. Partway through the third act, he was shot in the head by an actor and Southern sympathizer named John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln died the next morning at the age of 56. Mrs. Lincoln would later recall a carriage ride she and her husband had taken earlier that day, when Lincoln had seemed happier than she had seen him in years. With malice toward none, with charity for all, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Abraham Lincoln
house, as you can see on the screen there. She's a history professor at Howard University. And David Long, who is the author of The Jewel of Liberty, Abraham Lincoln's Re-Election and the End of Slavery, and also a professor at East Carolina in Greenville, North Carolina. Later, Linda Norbert Suits, curator of the Lincoln Home, National Historic Site, and historian Tim Townsend, also with the Lincoln Home National Historic Site. And then later uh, in the program, some uh, hour or so from now, Cullum Davis, who is the director of the Lincoln Legal Papers. We'll have our phone lines open. You can begin dialing at any point to join us in this program, which will last three hours here from Springfield, Illinois, on this June morning. It's 202-624-1111. If you live in the eastern and central time zones, 202-624-1115 in the mountain and Pacific time zones. David Long, we go from James Buchanan, someone who most people have never heard of, to Abraham Lincoln, who everybody knows. What is there to say about how he ever became president in 1860-61? Brian, from the moment that uh, Buchanan took the oath of office uh, in March of 1857, things began to go very badly for the Democrats. Uh, the next day, the Dred Scott decision was announced, the most controversial decision in the history of the Supreme Court. Uh, that uh, summer, the Lecompton Constitution, the bogus constitution, uh, prepared by the pro-slavery uh, Constitutional Convention in Kansas arrived and set off a rift that divided Buchanan from Douglas, the two most powerful Democrats in the country, the pre Democratic president and the Democratic leader in the Senate. Uh, things continued to go downhill, one event after another. There was a financial panic that set uh, off in 1857. Uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates helped to bring Lincoln to national attention and prominence. Buchanan's was probably the most corrupt administration up to that time in the history of the presidency. And then the last thing that happened, of course, was John Brown and Harper's Ferry, which perhaps made uh, the war inevitable. So a, a whole series of events had made it very unlikely that the Democrats would retain the White House and created a good prospect for the Republicans to take control of it. Edna Green Medford, was Abraham Lincoln the first Republican president in history? Yes, he was. What was he like in 1860? Who knew of him? Um, certainly by 1860, he was not as well known as some of the other candidates. In fact, there were uh, several other candidates, and that's one of the reasons why he did win, because the Democratic Party was so divided, and these other candidates certainly could not garner the uh, enough votes to be elected. But he was not that well known out of the state of, of Illinois, but was very well known, of course, in the Republican Party. The Republican Party was very new on the scene, but had made major strides uh, since the mid-50s when it was founded. How many people were there in the United States in 1860? Uh, about 31 million, I believe, about 23 million in the North, and uh, about 9 million or so um, eight or nine million in the South, and of course, uh, three and a half million of those in the South were enslaved people. And how many states, David Long? Thirty-three. How was it divided? Slave states, uh, southern states, right. and northern states? Fifteen slave states, eighteen free states, with Kansas poised to come in as another free state. Uh, and the war breaks out. We've got a lot to talk about and we have a call waiting, so let's get to our calls and we can just uh, continue our discussion on American presidents. Washington, D.C., our first call. Go ahead, please. You're on with Edna Medford and David Long. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to make a comment in regards to the, uh, uh, the election of 1860. Uh, it's the, the, uh, your guests are correct is the fact that uh, the Democratic Party was so uh, disorganized at that time. However, I read a, a book uh, in regards to uh, a, an effort by a number of Democrats to pick a compromise candidate, and uh, the interesting part is that compromise candidate wasn't going to run unless the other three that ended up running under Democratic various Democratic uh, Party uh, uh, statutes would go ahead and, uh, and then he would run if the other three would drop out. Stephen Douglas would not drop out. That... Uh, that uh, compromise candidate happened to be Jefferson Davis, uh, who had a lot of friends up north, actually, during that time, who was very well liked. And I just thought it would be interesting. I'd like to hear comments of, uh, of your guests on that. 
Thank you. Thanks. Professor Medford? Certainly there were, um, the other candidates were um, Stephen, Stephen A. Douglas, who was representing uh, the Northern Democratic interest, uh, John Breckinridge, who was representing um, the Southern Democratic interest, and then there, there was John, Bre um, there was um, John Bell uh, from Tennessee uh, representing the Constitutional Union Party. Uh, there was tremendous sectionalism in the country at that time, and that's one of the reasons why they could not uh, settle on, the Democratic Party could not settle on any one candidate, because people were, uh, at that point, voting along sectional lines. In the election of 1860, how many, well, what was the percentage of vote that Abraham Lincoln got? Forty percent of the total popular votes cast. Was that Nearly the, all of those, of course, in the North. And how about the rest of the candidates, the other three? Um, Douglas got about 29 percent, uh, Breckinridge about 18 percent, uh, Bell about 13 percent. Next call, Houston, Texas. Go ahead, please. You're on our American Presence series. Howdy, Brian. Hi. Uh, first of all, you just got those numbers exactly right. But um, I wanted to stack up two questions for uh, the C-SPAN library. First, my, my favorite citation of uh, implementation of democracy. Um, I wanted to know, and I wanted to know how much of this is fact and how much is mythology. Uh, Lincoln held a cabinet meeting prior to his signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, and he polled like three or four of his cabinet advisors whether he should or should not sign it. Um, in this mini enumeration, it was three against one, and old Abe said, one win. My second question is a little bit more complicated. Um, what's his name? Wilkes Booth. I, I heard that Booth back in the uh, early 50s or late 40s was involved in a, uh, 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 in Kentucky or, uh, I mean, Kansas or maybe Nebraska with a, a future general in the Confederacy. Um, basically, someone shot somebody's son or brother or stepbrother, and then the other side returned the favor, and it turned into a Hatfield versus the McCoys type thing. And I wanted to know if this is true and who the general was. Thanks. Thank you very on the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, Edna Medford? Uh, certainly the cabinet was quite concerned. It was an explosive issue. Uh, they really felt that it was going to be extremely pro problematic for the Union. Lincoln was determined that this was the time to issue the proclamation and certainly did go ahead and do so. He um, did ask for advice in terms of changing some of the wording and so forth and did consider uh, what they had to say, but he was determined at this point that this was the right time to issue the proclamation and so he did so. What about the, the Booth question? <laughs> Haven't a clue. Have never heard that John Wilkes Booth was out in the West and that was involved in something that involved the death of somebody. I can't, uh, can't speak to it. I understand. We have another call from Houston. Go ahead, Houston. You're on the air. Good morning. I want to tell you how much I and I think others appreciate your president series. I'm kind of a history buff. But uh, I've been concerned not just about Abraham Lincoln's papers, but others. The Nixon estate is fighting over the ownership of the uh, presidential papers, I believe, and tapes. All of this was produced by a governmental employee, the President of the United States. And all the papers, it would appear, that were produced during that time would belong to the government. I have not quite understand uh, how the estate can, can suggest that they own the papers, or even the President on the papers, that they want to have presidential libraries, which I think is a fine thing, and let the public come and see those papers and hear the tapes. But why or on what legal grounds could they say an employee who produced the papers at the expense of the government or the tapes at the expense of the government retains ownership to such a thing? All right, Connor, thanks. It's a little bit off the subject of what our show is about today, but let me ask a, a, a question related to Abraham Lincoln. How much money did he have? Do you have any idea when he was shot? How much wealth he had? Do you know, David Long? I, I couldn't tell you how much accumulated wealth he had. Uh, he was uh, he had done he had done well. He had had a lot of expenses, of course, some of which were uh, created by Mary uh, Todd Lincoln while in the White House. But um, they were comfortable. They weren't going to have to be concerned. And uh, either one of you happen to know who owned his papers back then? I mean, there's lots and lots of you know archival material. We'll, we'll talk with folks from this area and the National Park Service before the program's over. Maybe we can find out. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, either one of you have an opinion on the 
the, the question about the Nixon papers? Well, it's my understanding that initially his son, Robert, took possession of his papers, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I really don't have a comment about the, the Nixon Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, you're next. Go ahead, please. Hi, how are you doing? It's Good. a pleasure to uh, talk to C-SPAN. Uh, just one thing, uh, four, uh, three points quick. First of all, uh, Abraham Lincoln abused civil rights, and he spent on the writ of habeas corpus, and he also uh, uh, sent slaves back to slavery who the Union generals had freed uh, because he was uh, concerned about doing it legally. But it is a fact that Abraham Lincoln did send, slavery, uh, did send slaves back to slavery after Union soldiers had freed them. And also, it's my opinion that uh, when he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, is to give the Union cause a moral uh, taint, so uh, so to give them a moral uh, side, so to prevent uh, England and France from entering the war on the side of the Confederacy, which it very easily could have been done. It's a privilege to uh, talk to you, C-SPAN. I've been wanting to call in for many years, and my grandfather and I um, uh, always enjoyed setting presidents, and this is for my grandfather to pass on because he loved Abraham Lincoln. And, Grandpa, this is for you. And uh, Grant uh, always said that Lincoln was his uh, um, a favorite president. He said that Mr. Lincoln was always his favorite president. He's a big Lincoln buff. And another thing, too, um, but Lincoln did uh, abuse civil rights. Like G. Gordon Liddy said that, uh, the re that the moral reason why the uh, Watergate people did what they did was because of what Abraham Lincoln did during the, during the Civil War. You know, he suspended habeas corpus. He threw people in jail. He uh, shut down opposition newspapers. Okay, Minneapolis, I think we got the point. Uh, you're starting to repeat what you said earlier. Uh, and Medford, what, uh, what yes. did you say about this? He did indeed suspend the writ of habeas corpus in those areas. What does that mean? It's, it's the ability to arrest people and hold them in jail without actually uh, having a trial. And it, can be, it could go on for a long period of time. And in fact, some people are actually in jail uh, through the duration of the war. He feels it's necessary to do so because there, there are a significant number of people in the northern areas who uh, don't agree with him that this war should, e should even be prosecuted. And so he finds himself surrounded, especially you know, with Maryland, and there, there are people there who are very loyal to the Confederacy. Maryland certainly is not allowed to leave the Union, but there are people who are Confederate sympathizers, and they're causing some serious problems. David Long. Yeah. Uh, Brian, the, the prohibition on the suspension of the writ in the Constitution, uh, that just, like, just like the Second Amendment, people, people look at one part of it without looking at the other part. The other part of the prohibition says, except in times of invasion or rebellion. So there are two circumstances in which the writ of habeas corpus may be suspended. Uh, if we are invaded by foreign power or if there is an internal rebellion, certainly uh, this civil war is, a, is an example of, an, uh, of a rebellion. So the, the constitutional authority to do so is there. The controversy about Lincoln's suspension of the writ has to do with whether or not he as the president should suspend the writ or whether Congress should suspend the writ because it comes under Article I of the Constitution which defines con congressional responsibility. If you've just joined us, we are at the Lincoln Home at 8th and Jackson in Springfield. And on the screen, you can see from high atop what we call a cherry picker, a little camera that shows you downtown Springfield. And you can see the state capitol there off to the left and one of the office buildings right in the center. Right down to the right is the C-SPAN bus. And right next to that on the right there is the actual home, which is a two-story at this point. We'll find out how often or how long it was two-story. It's been changed many times, maintained by the National Park Service. And uh, we'll meet some of the folks that are involved here in the history of this place. They get some 300,000 visitors a year. And we'll be taking calls over the next uh, two hours and 45 minutes. Mark Farkas, our producer of this series, as we go to Princeton, West Virginia. Good morning. Uh, yes. Uh, what's been overlooked uh, often in the discussion of slavery was an indentured servitude. I have personal knowledge of this. And a lot of the settlers in the West were descended from people that were actual indentured servants who had run away from that, uh, from uh, their servitude or debtor's prison, which had uh, created sort of a semi peonage system. Uh, for instance, my great uncle had, was sold as an indentured servant by his father after the Civil War, even though this was supposedly illegal. And his uh, he ran away, and the sheriff he was arrested more than once and uh, brought back. He worked 14-hour days and was beat every night. And uh, this system uh, 
the entire West was based on the runaway indentured servants, uh, the settlers, and uh, I'd like to have the panelists comment on this situation. And the men for it. Uh, certainly there was indigent servitude in the country, but by the 1850s, that, that's not the case. Uh, the people who are serving as unfree laborers are African Americans, and there are almost four million of those. Um, if I may answer the, the question of the earlier caller as well, he talked about the return of um, enslaved people who had run away from their rebel owners. Uh, in the early part of the war, there was not a set policy about what to do with those people. Um, Benjamin Butler at Fortress Monroe, Virginia, decided to um, label them contrabands of war, and he was able, and so he allowed them to come into the fort and he put them to work. Uh, there, there wasn't a, a, a set policy um, early on, but e eventually um, they, they do uh, address that issue. There are uh, military commanders fairly early on who uh, are returning runaways to the owners of, of people who were aiding the Confederacy. David Long. Yeah, yeah. Two, ins two, two specific instances that uh, Edna's talking about. Uh, out in Missouri uh, with John Charles Fremont and, and, and in the southeastern south with uh, David Hunter, military commanders had undertaken political action. They had freed slaves themselves. Uh, Lincoln's objection, of course, was uh, not the freeing of the slaves, but the idea that military commanders would be doing it rather than the head of government. Um, and, and that is the reason why, in those instances, he did not uphold uh, what they had done. We have some videotape of the birthplace area of uh, Abraham Lincoln in Hodgenville, Kentucky where you can see a log cabin that is inside of a mausoleum down there and at this uh, spot uh, the log cabin was actually not the, even the same size I don't know where our videotape is we're supposed to have it on the screen and you can see the, the map there of, uh, there it is that's a, a big mausoleum there at the Lincoln birthplace historic site uh, and inside that is the log cabin which uh, is uh, they say at the site was not the actual log cabin nor is it as I was saying the actual size it's a I think it's a bit smaller to fit inside that mausoleum. Um, and also, uh, he moved from there, for a, spent some time over at Knob Creek. Uh, have you been there, David Long? No, I have not. Edna Medford, have you had a chance to see this? Mm, no, no I haven't. Uh, we have a next call from Springfield, Illinois, right here where we are located. Go ahead, please. Hello, Brian? Yes. Uh, good morning, and welcome to Springfield. Thank you. Do you mind talking right into the phone instead of the speaker? Sure. Is this better? Yes, much better. Okay, great. My question, um, as, as you said, I am here in Springfield, and I happen to be an attorney here in Springfield, and most attorneys in Springfield have some memorabilia of Abraham Lincoln. However, uh, as an African-American attorney, I was able to um, find information, and more specifically a painting of Abraham Lincoln by a renowned African-American artist, Mr. Charles White, of the Harlem Renaissance period. And um, in that painting, it shows some of the Afrocentric features uh, uh, of Abraham Lincoln. Um, the broad nose, lips, um, it's very unique in style. And I, I bring this up to, uh, to address the question I have. Could you tell us any um, authors or writers, historians, to give a uh, perspective from slavery, uh, the African American perspective as to Lincoln as being the great emancipator or not? Um, of course, now recent uh, ch uh, children school children, especially here in Springfield, um, believe that maybe Abraham Lincoln wasn't all that he um, was told or, or was uh, viewed as in history as being the great emancipator and the freer of slaves, that this was done by um, economic expediency and to keep the country together. But have there been any black uh, historians to talk on this issue, please? Edna Medford. Yes. Uh, let, let me give you my favorite author on this subject, uh, Benjamin Quarles wrote a book many years ago uh, called Lincoln and the Negro. And it, it's very balanced, uh, wonderful scholarship. Uh, he does address this question. Uh, I would send you back to that book. I don't think there's anything that has been done since then that's any better than that. It's a marvelous book. What's your reaction to the inference that he has African-American blood or Negroid blood in, in Abraham that, Lincoln? That, that's certainly a story that has been circulating <laughs> for a long time. Joel A. Rogers, um, decades ago, uh, wrote a, a little pamphlet called Five Negro Presidents, I think, and Lincoln was included in that, so that's still circulating. There's, I, I found nothing to suggest that 
he is of African American descent. Now you are from Charles City, Virginia, the home of a couple of other presidents, William Henry Harrison and John Tyler. When you were growing up, did you learn anything about that part of the world? Oh yes, that's why I'm a historian. <laughs> why are you a historian? How did it start? Uh, because I lived in an area that was so historically significant and I was fascinated by the history of that county and I uh, couldn't imagine doing anything but what I'm doing. Edna Medford has been at Howard University for 12 years now, and she did some work right out here in this part of the country, got her master's degree from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, where she spent a couple of years. David Long, how did you get interested in Abraham Lincoln? Um, as a child, I, my, my, my mother likes to tell the story of taking me through a department store book section, and I picked up a book and wouldn't put it down. She ended up having to buy it. It was a big picture book about the Civil War. And from the very moment that I became interested in the Civil War, the most compelling figure of the generation to me was Abraham Lincoln. And so it was a natural, uh, natural thing to follow from the initial interest in the Civil War. Hometown, Middletown, Ohio. Yes. Got a law degree. Yes. Back in 1972 from Ohio State University and got his Ph.D. from Florida State in 1993 and has taught for the last four years at Carolina uh, East Carolina, East University. Carolina University. We go next to Cincinnati, Ohio. Go ahead, please. Yes, my great-grandfather fought in the Union Army, was a prisoner of war, captured and shipped to Virginia at a place called Clifty Point, a, a Confederate prison camp. At the same time he was in prison, Judiah P. Benjamin, and I'm getting this information from the rise of the American civilization. Judiah, published in 1927, Judiah P. Benjamin, Secretary of the State of the Secretary of State of the Confederacy, a Jewish lawyer, she, uh, sent emissaries to England and Ireland, tell them that any immigrants that came to the United States would be put in the army. And, and forced to fight when, in fact, they were sent to the United States to help build the railroads. Could you comment, please? David Long. Well, certainly a lot of people came to the United States during, during the Civil War. In the North, the population actually increased in spite of the 360,000 deaths that were a result of the war. Uh, most of them came, or at least a, a fair number of them came, as contract labor. In other words, uh, somebody paid for their passage so that they could work in the war industries that had to uh, you know, produce the massive amounts of munitions to fight the war. Uh, particularly uh, in this group would be the Irish, a large number of Irish during the war. Uh, the, the gentleman's question had to do, I believe, though, with the South and he, he's, he's, he mentions Judah Benjamin. Uh, I'm not sure that the South or the Confederacy had a similar program, and of course for immigrants to come to the South they would have had to contest the blockade unless they came in at the North and then managed to uh, go overland to get South. Um, I, I'm not aware that, that there was a, a very significant immigration into the Southern United States during the Civil War, but certainly in the North there was. Let's go back to uh, 1860 when Abraham Lincoln was elected president. How do you think at that point he became known in this country? What led up to, and, and, and what impact did the Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1858 have on anybody's knowledge of him in the 33 states? Mm -hmm. uh, the debate had a tremendous impact, uh, but, but before he's elected, what has happened is the country has gone through um, a horrific decade. It's a decade uh, of tremendous sectionalism and great tension, great conflict during the period starting with uh, the issue over the extension of slavery into the territory that had been acquired by Mexico. And so by the time of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, uh, the whole issue of the extension of slavery was on everyone's mind. Uh, and Lincoln and Douglas debated that issue, debated the extension, and debated the morality of slavery as well. And so as a consequence, he became well known in uh, the state of Illinois, but became a leader of the Republican Party as well. And so eventually what happens is, even though he loses uh, that election, it's, it's a senatorial contest. He loses that election, but he, ultimately he gains uh, because he really does come across, he takes the moral high road in, in this and is eventually able to capture the Republican uh, nomination because of that, I think. In those days, were, was there a telegraph? Was there, yes. was there uh, railroads? And how did they move around? And how extensive 
was a transportation system then? Uh, you're talking about two of the, uh, the advances during this period that had significantly changed uh, the speed of movement by which people could travel and how quickly word of or news got from one place to another. The telegraph was in place by this time. Uh, Civil War is often referred to, in fact, as the first telegraph war, the first railroad war. Railroads played a major uh, part as well. So you, you certainly had, uh, had those things influencing the movement of people, and they, they certainly had an impact on the outcome of the war. Uh, one last question, we'll take another call. Uh, we're in the parlor where the kids were not allowed, I understand, and we'll find out more from Linda Suits later, but behind it was the original bedroom of Abraham and Mary Lincoln. Uh, when he was elected uh, in the convention, the Republican convention, I believe in Chicago, and they came down here to tell him that, if I remember right reading Benjamin Thomas's book, it was at that point he learned that Ham Hannibal Hamlin was going to be his running mate. Did he have nothing to say about that? Well, you know, certainly what they're trying to do is balance the ticket as, as, um, they, as parties do now. And um, certainly Lincoln was willing to go along with that. He certainly understood that there would have to be that balance. Either one of you know much about Hannibal Hamlin? Uh, not very much, but, but I, I just wanted to, to say that certainly up to the time the nominations took place uh, in Chicago, uh, nobody knew that Abraham Lincoln was going to be the nominee. So in, in terms of consulting him as to who he would like to have as his vice president, uh, nobody had really given serious thought to that. It was, it was believed by many people, if not most, that William Henry Seward would get the nomination. What happens that morning of, of the nominations and the voting uh, on the nominees is really a pretty incredible uh, sequence of events to take place in a short time, all of which benefit Lincoln and hurt Seward. Uh, so no, he, he's not been asked about Hannibal Hamlin. He had met Hannibal Hamlin. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure he would have had any reason to suggest that he would or wouldn't like to have him as running mate. Abraham Lincoln is buried here in Springfield along with three of his four children and his wife and also William Herndon in the same cemetery. Uh, and Hannibal Hamlin is buried near Bangor, Maine. Let's go next to Louisville, Kentucky. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Good morning, Brian. How are you? Fine. Welcome. Enjoy your program. Uh, just a way of comment, uh, the, the telegraph was announced on May 24th of, 19, of 1844, just for informational purposes. I had a comment and a question. Uh, the comment um, uh, that I have is about uh, Lincoln taking office in March of, of 1861. I guess what I've thought about is the Fort Sumter attack on April 12th of 1861. If the South had simply gone limp and not fired on Fort Sumter, just declared independence just seceded and then gone ahead about their business and ignored the north i've always thought that it would have been very hard for lincoln to mobilize the country in a, in a civil war and maybe the south could have prevailed in that way and i wonder what your guests uh... thought about that issue and the medford it certainly would have been more difficult to galvanize the the north but lincoln could not have let it go at that he would have had to do something uh... to act he was so wedded to the idea of union there's no way he would have allowed the south to leave but he had committed himself to we will not fire the first shot uh, you cannot have a war without being yourselves the aggressors in his in his inaugural uh, address so uh, if, if the South had simply left Fort Sumter in place and not done anything, it's it, difficult to... There, there would have been a crisis that would have come eventually. You couldn't have what was taking place in the Lower South without there eventually being uh, a crisis that would force somebody to take action. But Lincoln was very committed to forcing the South to fire the first shot, and, it had, and the caller is absolutely right. It had a tremendous galvanizing effect in the North. Our two historians here on the set, which is located in the parlor of the Lincoln home at 8th and Jackson in Springfield, are Edna Green Medford and David Long, and they'll be with us throughout this program. We're going to meet uh, Linda Norbert Suits, who is the curator here at the Lincoln Home National Historic Site in just a moment. Next call, Alamogordo, New Mexico. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Greetings from the lands of enchantment. Welcome. Uh, my question has to do with Abraham Lincoln relationship with his father, his mother, his stepmother, and his oldest son, Robert. And also, did he exhibit any outstanding uh, traits of intelligence uh, when he was a young man? Thank you. David Long. Uh, in, in most of the relationships that you mentioned, or at least in several of the relationships you mentioned, of course, there was, there was some tension. There was some estrangement. Uh, Lincoln was not very close to his father. He did not attend his father's funeral. 
Um, and um, he, he also mentioned uh, mother, stepmother, mother, and stepmother. Uh, I have every reason to believe that Lincoln uh, adored uh, both his mother and his stepmother. I uh, gave them a great deal of credit for who he was. And Let me show some videotape of uh, the 14 year home in Lincoln City, Indiana, which is not a great deal of distance from here. You can see that on the map there. You see Hodgenville, where he was born, Lincoln City, where he spent 14 years. He was actually seven years in Kentucky, and then move on to the Springfield, New Salem area. His father is actually buried in Charleston, uh, near Charleston. There you have uh, Lincoln City, Indiana, one of the log cabins in that area. None of these were there at the time, I believe. And his mother, Nancy Lincoln, is buried there. Uh, do either one of you know what year in his life that she died? He must have been about nine years old, I believe, when she yes. died. Continuing to look at some of the video from Lincoln City, Indiana, which is in the southern part, uh, not that far away from Evansville and uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Abraham Lincoln killed on the date? April 14th. Shot on April 14th, dies in the early morning hours uh, at 7 o'clock a.m. on the 15th. Looking at video from Lincoln City, Indiana, the Lincoln Boyhood National Memorial, which is available and open to, that's the, I believe that's the gravesite of his mother, right there in the, on the grounds. We're now going to meet a woman who has been at her job here for the last eight years, and she will give us some perspective on where we're sitting uh, in this room. Greg Fabic on the camera that you can see on the screen at the moment. Linda Norbert Suits, tell us something about this this home that we don't know? Um, the rooms that you're sitting in are the parlors, um, very formal rooms. The boys were not allowed in those rooms. The Lincolns were very indulgent parents, but they didn't allow the boys in those two rooms. In fact, there's a letter to Lincoln as, a pre as president, um, someone describing what's going on in Springfield. And they say that your house looks very nice. The Tiltons, who are renting the house, have no children to mess it up. Um, so these rooms were always kept nice for visitors. Um, the table in the back room, Lincoln um, had clients uh, that he brought into the house and would work with them there. Uh, so he also used it as an office sometimes. Uh, the room that I'm standing in, which is adjacent to the parlor, uh, next door to it is the dining room. It's a rather small dining room, but a dining room nonetheless, and that was very important for the Lincoln Station in life, that they have a dining room, that they have a separate room to eat from the kitchen. The help could eat in the kitchen, but the Lincolns could have uh, their meals here. Uh, it was uh, by 1860, the time period that we're displaying in the house, it would have been Mary, Abraham, and the two younger boys, Willie and Tad, who would have been having their meals in this dining room. How would you describe the relationship uh, between Mary Todd Lincoln and her husband? I think it was a close relationship. Um, they relied on each other a lot. They uh, uh, had a lot a similar background. They both lost their mothers when they were young. They both enjoyed reading and they both enjoyed their children very much. Uh, so I think they had a close relationship. Mary could be difficult, um, but I think they enjoyed each other's company. We hear and, and read stories about uh, when he would return after being out on the circuit and all come back, there were some screaming matches between the two of them. Or is, David, you were going to say there, there were some stormy moments. Um, that, I, I think Lynn is right. I think I do think they genuinely cared about you, each, each other, but I think they were both difficult people to live with. And that led to, uh, Mary was a very high-strung woman, and there were some difficult situations. Linda Suits, how did you get in, in involved in all this in the first place? Um, well, I'm a native of the Springfield area, although didn't have a desire, a particularly burning desire to work with uh, the Lincoln home. But uh, I uh, uh, got a degree in museum studies, and I went to the Chicago area and then came back to Springfield and eventually ended up here at the Lincoln home. When people come through this house and they're in the area where you're in, what do they start to ask uh, when they ask the Rangers questions? Um, they want to know a lot about how the Lincolns lived um, and what they did in their house. And if you'll follow me, we can go on into the sitting room. Um, and it's a really uh, more family part of the house where you can really see um, more about what the Lincolns would have done. Now, we're sitting on, on the other side of that wall there on your left. 
uh, which we, we call this room where we're sitting, the parlor, and what's that room called there? This is called the sitting room, and it's a bridge between the formal public side of the house and the private family side of the house. This is where the family would have spent their evenings. Uh, the boys would have played over here on the table. We have a stereoscope. It's like a modern, um, it's a, like a modern, uh, uh, Toy, uh, toy for children, they'd put cards in there and they looked uh, three-dimensional in there. Can I ask you about the kids? At the, Let's just pick the year, oh, pick 1860, the year that he was elected president. Uh, how many children were alive at that point? There were three children. In 1860, Robert was away at school. He was no longer living in the house. And uh, Willie and Tad were, were living uh, here in the house. What year did they lose Eddie? Eddie was um, just short of his fourth birthday. Um, and when he died. And he probably died in the back room, in the back parlor. That was the Lincoln's bedroom. Um, so farther back in the room that you're sitting in is probably where Eddie passed away. Well, Eddie and Willie and Ted all died. What, was the, what were their illnesses? We believe Eddie died of uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. It's a little hard to say. The, birth, or the death certificates were not very specific. Um, it, his said consumption, but we think it was tuberculosis. Willie died in the White House. Um, once again, they said malarial fever. It may have been typhoid. Um, and uh, Tad didn't die until much later, until 1871, and he had pleurisy and pneumonia, and that's what he died of. What were their relationships with their father? Very close. Lincoln loved his children. There's even a quote that says he loved what his children loved and hated what they hated. And he liked lots of children. There's a story of Lincoln watching a parade downtown with all the little boys hanging on his coattails and he's got a little girl in his arms. Um, sometimes he'd gather up the neighborhood boys, almost like a, a Cub Scout leader, and put them all in his carriage and go down to the river so that they could all go fishing. Um, he tried to spend as much time as he could with them when he was here and always wanted them to be happy. Linda Norbert Suits is with us in uh, the Lincoln House. And I said earlier that there are about 300,000 visitors here a year. How many of those are kids? Um, about 20 to 25 percent of our visitorship, which is actually closer to 400,000 people, is school tours and bus tours. So almost a qu uh, 100,000 people that come through here are either school children or, or folks on, on bus organized tours. And how, how much do they know by the time they've gotten here, they've learned in school? Wow, it varies so widely. It depends on how they've been prepared. Um, some hardly have any background at all, and some are very interested and really keen to find out a lot about him. Now, you're going to walk from there into the hallway, I believe, next? Yes. Showing us, uh, was this the front door that we're about to see uh, back in uh, Mr. Lincoln's time? Yes, it was. And if on the outside of the door is the door plate. There were no uh, house numbers at that time period. And so uh, people put plates on their houses, and the one on this says A. Lincoln. Can you open it up while you're there? Just sure. Just reach over there and open the door and show us what you're talking about. Is this the way everybody lived in uh, Springfield at the time? Correct. See the front door? And they had no house numbers. Correct. That wasn't until much later that house numbers were instituted. And a visitor would knock on the door or ring the doorbell. And um, there's a wire here that goes along the wall. And there's this nice little curly cue with a bell on the end. And this is the Lincoln's doorbell. Now, we've disconnected it so that it doesn't get damaged. Um, but you'd ring the Lincoln's doorbell. This little bell would tinkle. And someone would come to the door to open it. Um, much to Mary's chagrin, Lincoln would open the door horrors in his shirt sleeves without even his coat on. Um, bad manners, the hired girl or one of the boys should open the door. Um, and usher visitors in, and if it was a visitor for Mary, um, sometimes he might tell them that Ma was upstairs putting on her trot and harness and would be down shortly. And this, these are some of the things that I think got Mary's hot temper going. Now, did you tell me this morning that when you took the little uh, ruler home last night to your two kids, uh, uh, Catherine six and what, Sarah four? Correct. That the four-year-old looked at that ruler with all the presence pictures on there and picked out Abraham Lincoln? She sure did. She, they know a lot about Lincoln. They've been here and they know his picture and they can pick him out on the money and, and uh, uh, can pick him out in a lot of different places and are always pointing out Mr. Lincoln. And we call him Mr. Lincoln because he wasn't president when he was here in Springfield. So they, they talk about Mr. Lincoln. Linda Norbert Suits uh, got a master's degree at Eastern Illinois University in 1987 and she's a graduate of Knox College in Galesburg, which was, oh, let me see, the Fourth, fifth site of the Lincoln-Douglas debate? I believe so. 
thank you very much for joining us this morning. We'll see you a little bit later. You're welcome. And we'll go back to the phones. Our next call for our two guests here on the set, New York City. Good morning, New York City. You're on the air. Yes, good morning. My call is um, in reference to countries that were southern sympathizers, and how did we go about mending fences with those countries who had supported the South with uh, arms and or money, if we did at all? Thank you. Um, thank you. And let me ask whether, how close Great Britain was to the South then, David Long. Well, they were pretty close. Um, there, were, there were probably more British people who supported or, or hoped that the South would succeed. Of course, no small part of that had to do that <laughs> with the wish to see happen in the United States what had been done to Britain uh, back in 1776. But, but trade that was conducted, of course, was not conducted between the British government and the Confederate States. It was between individual or private contractors in Britain and France and uh, the, the southern states. There was a great deal of friction between the United States government and the British government over just what recognition Britain would extend to the Confederate States, what she would do how she would act towards the blockade, how all of these things, and, and the fact that commerce raiders were constructed in Britain that did a great deal of damage to the, uh, to the northern uh, fleet, to the northern merchant marine. We're going to meet Cullum Davis a little bit uh, later in our program. He is working on the legal papers of Abraham Lincoln, who was a lawyer from this community. And we want to remind you that um, we have an educator's hotline for those of you who want to become involved, teachers who we're talking to. We have a C-SPAN in the classroom, American President's uh, website, a chance for you to get involved at no cost to you, especially if you're getting ready for the fall school uh, year, some starting in August and September. We have a lot of material that we'll make available as the year goes on because we're just at President number 16. We have 41 uh, to go. I mean, not 41 to go, but 41 in its entirety. And the telephone number to call if you want to get in touch with our education department, Joanne Wheeler's group, is 202 626-4858 and the number is there on the screen and also the website address cspan.org slash classroom americanpresidents.org is the website that deals with this whole series again that telephone number if you are a teacher and want to join at no cost to you and there will be no future cost to you for this particular service is 202-626-4858 we have eight cameras here in Springfield Illinois that's a camera high above the Lincoln House with the C-SPAN school bus off to the right and the State House off to the left in downtown Springfield, a community of about 120,000 people. And uh, the mayor here in this community was over here to see us this morning, Karen Hassara, who's been mayor since 1995 and uh, a big Lincoln buff, obviously, if you live here. For those who have just joined us, Edna Medford, bring us up to date the little things about Abraham Lincoln that give us a better picture. He was elected president in what year? Uh, in 1860. And when he was elected, how big a vote did he get and how many people did he run against? He got 40% of the popular vote. Uh, he ran against three other candidates, uh, and, but was fairly um, easily elected in terms of the electoral college vote. Everybody writes that he didn't get any votes from the South. Are they talking about any votes or electoral votes? Um, I cannot recall if he actually got, well, most of, the, most of his uh, votes came from almost totally from the northern states. Certainly. How many times was he elected president? Uh, twice. The second time around, do you remember what the percentage of victory was and who did he run against? Uh, I believe he got 55% of uh, the popular vote. Uh, and he ran against George McClellan, uh, the Democratic candidate, who had been one of his generals. Now, he was a Republican, uh, David Long. How about the Congress, the House, and the Senate? Do we know who was in control? Republicans were in control uh, from the moment that the, that the Southern representatives and senators pulled out back in 1860 and 61. Now, they did suffer some losses in the House in the 1862 midterm elections, but they still maintained about a 17-vote majority. Um, th also, they were calling themselves by this point, by late in the war, they were no, call no, no longer calling themselves Republicans, but Union Party, because there were a lot of Democrats who supported the war, who actually supported the administration more than they did the opposition Democrats. They I read called. somewhere where that Hannibal Hamlin, his first vice president, was originally a Democrat? Yes, he was. Do you remember why he changed? Uh, the same reason that many Democrats changed in the 18th. Um, the, the major event that changed 
many people from their former affiliations to join the Republican Party was the Kansas-Nebraska Act and what came out of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Many people became disillusioned with the existing parties at that time and joined this new political grouping in the hope that it might be able to do something to make a meaningful stand. Could African Americans or blacks vote in 1860? In some areas of the North they could. Uh, in New York they could vote, but there was a property qualification and a residency requirement for African Americans only, not for anyone else. But I believe in five states of the North they could vote. They could not vote elsewhere. Could women vote? Women could not vote. Let's but go. women were very active in politics anyway. Let's go to St. Augustine, Florida next. Go ahead, please. Good morning. I want to thank you for this uh, wonderful series that you're doing. Uh, well, I'm calling from St. Augustine. I was born and raised in Davenport, Iowa, just uh, not too far away from there, and had some wonderful memories as a school person uh, visiting on several occasions, both uh, the Springfield site and the New Salem site. Um, and Davenport was a, a place that had to, uh, Lincoln had something to do with, and I'm wondering if perhaps Mr. Long might have some information on this, because I don't really recall it from those years ago. Uh, that was where the first uh, railroad bridge crossed the Mississippi River, and uh, it was a real problem there because of the steamboat lines, and there was some sort of a, uh, an incident where a barge was set afire and ran down into the uh, bridge abutments and burned, uh, burned the bridge. And Lincoln was involved uh, in, that, uh, in that legal dispute. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, you have any information on that. David, well, I, believe, I believe the caller is referring to the Epi Afton case, which was perhaps one of the most uh, famous cases that Lincoln did as a... As a trial lawyer and, um, and had to do with uh, the rights of the railroad uh, crossing uh, a river as opposed to steamboats coming down the river and when the steamboat crashed into a railroad uh, abutment or structure uh, the lawsuit arose out of that. Lincoln represented the railroad interests in that case if I'm not mistaken and if I'm not mistaken he also was victorious in that. We have a video picture for you from the Lincoln Herndon law offices which are located across the street from the old state house, which we showed you earlier on the screen, if we can take a look at that right now, that we'll be going down there live in a few moments, in about 20 minutes, to uh, meet Cullen Davis and find out about his program that he's been uh, been involved with, the Lincoln Legal Papers, uh, later on, and we'll continue with open phones. This program today is some three hours long. Edna Medford, some of the names of his cabinet officers when he was president. Uh, Seward was Secretary of State. Uh, Chase was Secretary of the Treasury. Is that Salmon Chase? Uh, yes, yes. Hmm? Salmon Chase and William Seward? Yes, that's correct. And uh, Gideon Wells was Secretary of the Navy. Um, David Long, anyone else that you can mention? Montgomery Blair was the Postmaster General. Uh, Edward Bates was the Attorney General. Um, what have we, oh, what? Edward Stan Stanton was the Secretary of War for most of the war, although initially Simon Cameron had been the Secretary of War. Seems like there might be one person we're missing. John Usher uh, uh, sure from Indiana was the uh, Secretary of the Interior. I'm not sure where the next call is coming from uh, because I haven't, haven't got a new one on the screen yet. Why don't we just go ahead and take it and they can tell me where they're calling from. Where are you calling from? Uh, Washington, D.C. Good morning. What would you like to say this morning? Uh, I want just to talk about the role that African-American troops played in saving the Union and uh, what role Frederick Douglass played in uh, helping Lincoln to decide that it was time to uh, enlist African-American troops. And uh, In fact, was it the northern gov governors who were actually pushing Lincoln to uh, enlist African-American troops also? Because they were like, well, we're losing men and it looks like we're going to lose this war unless uh, black troops are infused in the war. And I just Thank like to you. get our comments. Edna Medford. Uh, African Americans played a very prominent role in uh, assisting the Union in the war. There were as many as 180,000 um, men who served in uh, the Army, uh, at least 20 or more thousand who were serving in the Navy as well. Um, the Northern governors really did press Lincoln to uh, admit African Americans to uh, the military effort because there was a, a conscription. Uh, the northern governors had to make sure that there were a certain number of people from those states who were serving and certainly as the war uh, dragged on it was more difficult to do that and so they believed that with African American men joining that would take some of the pressure. In terms of uh, Frederick Douglass, he was a thorn in the side of Lincoln uh, from the, the very beginning was pressing 
for uh, the inclusion of African Americans because African Americans at the beginning of the war saw this as a war of liberation, not just a war for the preservation of the Union, but a war for the liberation of the nearly four million enslaved African Americans as well. And they wanted a part in that whole struggle. Uh, there's a home, the Frederick Douglass home in Washington, D.C., which is uh, over in Anacostia, but he's buried in Rochester, New York, mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. Susan B. Anthony somewhere near him. <laughs> What's that all about? Why, how well, did he get Well, it? he had spent quite a bit of time in Rochester uh, before coming to uh, the Washington area after the war and had published uh, a couple of newspapers from that area as well. And uh, certainly during the war years, constantly pressured uh, Lincoln to uh, not only admit uh, African Americans as troops in the army, but also to emancipate uh, those African Americans still enslaved in the South. We go next to Groton, Massachusetts. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm calling about Vice President Hannibal Hamlin. I'm just wondering why he wasn't renominated in 1864. Good question. Thanks. David Long. Um, in 1864, the Republicans or the Union Party had an opportunity to make a statement that, that, that this was not a war about political parties, but about patriots and traitors, if you will. Uh, so there were, as I said, a lot of, number of Democrats who joined with the Republican in, in coalition during the war. Andrew Johnson was the one Southern member of Congress who did not leave when his state seceded. He was a senator from Tennessee who remained and really had no truck with the South, had, uh, no sympathy, he despised uh, the planter class of the South. Uh, by choosing uh, Johnson, you have a Democrat and a Southerner on the ticket, which appears to give it, uh, you know, that the ticket now represents the nation rather than simply a section and a party. And that was, that was really the reason. There's been a controversy over the years as to Lincoln's role in the choice of Johnson. I think that uh, Don Fehrenbacher, Lincoln historian, has pretty well settled that it was, it really was undertaken by the, the party members as opposed to Lincoln. He certainly didn't object to Johnson. Brandenburg, Kentucky, next. Go ahead, please. Yes, hello, Brian. Thank you Hi. very much for this wonderful program. Uh, it may be a little premature to bring up this subject. I suppose you're planning on it sooner or later. But my impressions of Lincoln and the fact that we were so fortunate to have such a man at the helm at the time of such a crisis, and <clears throat> I've, I've come to the conclusion long ago that he was a very complete human being. He was able to deal with secular things, but he was also undergirded by a tremendous spiritual strength. Uh, he didn't articulate this all the time, but he did quite often in his speeches, in his letters, uh, speak of the influence of the spirit of the Bible and so forth. Uh, I don't suppose nowadays he would even be allowed to because of the so-called separation of church and state but I think that it's vitally important to know how much this man depended on fundamental principles of life and the definition, definitions of humanity and in, insisting on those. Look how he depended on the spiritual aspects of the Declaration of Independence and all these sort of things. Uh, if they care to comment now, I'll hold up and listen. Thanks. Professor Edna Green Medford. Now, certainly he had a spiritual background, but Lincoln was rather suspicious of organized religion and never joined uh, a church, uh, rarely attended. Um, so certainly that background was there. Read the Bible quite a bit, uh, could quote it, uh, very well versed in the Bible, but did not believe that uh, organized religion was for him. Thousand Oak, California. Go ahead, please. Yes, Brian. I'm glad my call came in now because my second great-grandfather was Abraham Lincoln's preacher and teacher. He preached, he was the third preacher at Little Pigeon Creek Church in uh, Spencer County, Indiana, and was also his uh, teacher at Troy, Indiana. Hmm. And he's buried on Hurricane Creek in Perry County, Indiana. It took us 21 years to find his grave. How did you go about it? I been doing genealogy for the last 40 years, and I had no idea when I was growing up back there that uh, any of this was in uh, my family's background. How did you find it? Uh, just through uh, a 
uh, going to the courthouses and everything. I made trips from California back there and went through uh, courthouses and uh, just dug anywhere I could could find. To, Thanks. Uh, Thanks a lot for calling. I, it uh, brings up a question uh, about uh, archiving and genealogy and all that. Uh, you're involved in the new Lincoln Library uh, to be built here in Springfield. Can you tell us about that? Uh, it's still in, in the works. <laughs> we're, we're still planning it. Uh, I'm on the, uh, the Scholars Advisory Board. I think it's going to be magnificent. Uh, what we're attempting to do is to make it very accessible to all people, uh, just as Lincoln was. It's incredible uh, how many different types of people he appealed to. And certainly, uh, we're all attempting to make that library uh, reflect the kind of person uh, Lincoln was, and to make uh, people aware of his complexity. I think we do a disservice to him when we uh, prevent him from showing through the way he really was and all of his complexity. I was interested to find out last night uh, from Norm Hellers, who runs this whole complex here, that Peter Fitzgerald and Dick Durbin have law, I mean, have uh, senatorial offices right down the street here in this little four block complex that they rent from uh, the General Services Administration and this, this group here. Uh, this is, if it turns out the way it's planned, I understand it's going to be a rather expensive library that uh, and to think the city of Springfield is going to spend something like 10 million. There's the state is going to spend a lot of money on it. What, what do you think the use will be? I would defer to uh, the board member. I mean, from your standpoint, is there a need uh, for a national library uh, devoted to Abraham Lincoln? Uh, I, certainly, certainly. I mean, there are, there are archival sources, uh, the, the Library of Congress, the Manuscript Room, National Archives. Uh, there are uh, Lincoln papers in various places around the country and, and libraries, but to have a central location where all of the different things relating to the life of Lincoln would be uh, on, uh, on deposit, be, uh, to be accessed by a researcher would be invaluable. Uh, Springfield has been that essentially up to now, but, but this I think is where they're not talking about doing it in a much bigger and better way than it has been in the past. Buffalo, New York, you're next. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'm calling to ask uh, Professor Medford before commented on the role of women in the election and their strong uh, influence in politics. I'm wondering if she could comment in more detail about their influ women's influence on the election of Lincoln. Um, some uh, women at that time, uh, of course women are not uh, allowed to vote at that time, but they, some of them are actually writing um, about these elections. Uh, some are making speeches, even though it's still frowned upon. Uh, women are supporting in a variety of other ways as well. Uh, one of the, the, uh, the things that drew uh, Mary Todd Lincoln and, and Abraham Lincoln to each other was Mary Todd's love of politics. So she could uh, converse about political issues as well as could any man during the period, and did. Let me ask you about the number of, of times he ran for a, uh, election of anything. Do you know? <laughs> um, I, I couldn't tell you exactly because I'm not sure how many times he ran for and was elected to the state house in uh, Illinois. But it would strike me that it must have been probably about ten times total between the presidency, two, two runs for the United States Senate, then when he ran for, the, for Congress and, and won the congressional seat, and probably about five times for the Illinois legislature. When did he actually serve in the U.S. House of Representatives? From 1947 until 1949. He was elected in 46, but at that point in history, you didn't take your seat until more than a year after the election had, had occurred. So, so he took a seat in December of 47, and that Congress would have convened uh, or, or would have adjourned in uh, a March of, of 1849. Let's go next to Chautauqua, New York. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'm curious about uh, some of your comments pertinent to uh, Lincoln being a true uh, dark horse candidate. Uh, several times you've addressed uh, how did he become known. And I, I know that he gave a speech at a college in New York City called uh, the Cooper Union where he uh, uh, titled the speech, uh, might makes right. And I'm wondering, did that speech uh, foster his reputation uh, in the big city uh, political leagues? And uh, did the uh, New York City people then see him as less of a hayseed and more of a, a thoughtful, true uh, candidate? I'll hang up and listen. You bet it did. <laughs> All of uh, the New York Republican 
um, uh, pundits of that day were there. Uh, they wanted to see this Westerner that they had heard about, read about debating Douglas. Uh, the impression that Lincoln made at that, you know, one person who was present said, nobody since St. Paul has had this kind of an impact. Um, they, 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 when he was done, the audience came to its feet as one. Uh, it was apparently Lincoln at its best, and he, he knew the importance of it, and he worked very carefully on that speech, and it was a, it was a very good speech. Let me ask uh, Edna Medford, or David Long, either one, to fill in the blanks here. What I saw when I was up at Hill Dean, the Robert Todd Lincoln home in, in Vermont, up in Manchester, a little note about the Cooper Union speech and what happened afterwards. That I, I've not seen this anywhere else. It said he was paid $200 to give the speech and then went on to tour New England and to give speeches. And one of the reasons he needed the money for his son, who was at Phillips Academy, because he had tried to, I don't know, 13 or 14 times to get into Harvard and failed, but he needed another year at Phillips Academy to go there. Uh, it also re reminded me that maybe back in those days you were making money speech making around the country, just like some of our folks are today. Can any, can any of you fill in the blanks on any of that? Well, he received some handsome honoraria after, after the, uh after the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he was known everywhere, and he had a, uh, a full schedule of speaking. He traveled across uh, Indiana and Ohio, and uh, uh, then into the um, New England states, and the Cooper Union was sort of the final touch. I mean, that was some of the most important Republicans in the country. He has achieved legitimacy when he speaks to them and, and convinces them that he is, a, he is forced to be reckoned with in the Republican Party. We are going to come back to the two of you a little later on. We're going to let you have a break and uh, go to some other folks. And thank uh, Edna Medford and David Long for joining us for the first, uh, I've lost track of time, hour or so of our program here on a three-hour program in Springfield, Illinois. Before we introduce you to a couple more guests, let me remind you that our educator number to call if you are a teacher, these are, this is for teachers, 202-626-4858. Number's on the screen can become a member of C-SPAN the Classroom and we'll provide you materials uh, in connection with our American President series which is going on all year long and will end somewhere around December the 20th when we'll do the 41, 41th, 41st President of the United States, uh, William Jefferson Clinton. But today we are in Springfield, Illinois, our 16th President, Abraham Lincoln. His home is there on the screen at the right. You're looking out over the city of Springfield, uh, a village of 130,000 people. And you're going to meet Cullum Davis at the uh, Herndon Lincoln Law Offices in a few minutes. He's the director of the Lincoln uh, Legal Papers. But for the moment, Tim Townsend is standing outside. Where are you, Mr. Townsend? Uh, right outside uh, the Lincoln home. What's your job here? I'm the historian here. And what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. Um, it means answering people's questions, whether they write or email or phone. Uh, it means responding to staff questions. Uh, it also means research uh, the houses and the neighbors in the neighborhood here. How long have you done this? I've been here about nine years now. What can you tell us about this neighborhood? Well, historically, uh, this was a very mixed neighborhood, um, both racially, uh, class-wise. There were everything from, from a successful attorney, Abraham Lincoln, to a state auditor, uh, to uh, African-American drayman or a carriage driver, buggy driver. Um, it was a, a much different neighborhood in some ways than it is today. The streets would have been dirt or mud, uh, would have been livestock roaming the streets, pigs especially, to kind of help clean up the streets. Um, and this was the edge of Springfield at the time Lincoln was here. He, uh, this was a, kind of a new neighborhood, basically. Now, how long did he live in this house? He was there 17 years. Has it changed much? Changed quite a bit. Uh, the Lincolns moved into a small cottage, one and a half stories, basically. And uh, after about two years living here, they, they uh, <clears throat> excuse me, added a, uh, a new room to the back, basically slid the kitchen wing over and added a, a room. Um, prior to that, there were basically a front, front room area where you, where you folks are, and then, and then across the entry hall, and then a back kitchen wing. Um, the largest and most dramatic addition was in 1855 and into 1856 when they added the full second story to the home, uh, basically reflecting Lincoln's growing prosperity and success as a lawyer and politician who was able to, to invest in the home. I mentioned earlier that uh, the two senators from the state of Illinois, Dick Durbin and Peter Fitzgerald, have offices on this property. How often do they come here and, and how much use does it get? 
Well, uh, with, with Senator Durbin, um, he's here fairly regularly. This is his, his main home office. This was also his, his office when he was a uh, uh, U.S. representative. Um, Senator Fitzgerald is, is here when his schedule allows. Um, I think his main office is up in Chicago area, but, uh, but he comes down uh, fairly regularly as well. How many houses are there in this complex that are roped off? Well, there's, there's 14 historic structures here in the park, and, and the main area, the historic zone, as we call it, along 8th Street, is where the, the bulk of the structures are. Now, if you get in a car and drive from Chicago, it's so uh, three and a half hours. You drive from Sp uh, St. Louis, 90 minutes or so. How many visitors a year do you get, and where do the most of them come from? Well, we get uh, to the site approximately 400,000 a year. Um, there aren't quite that many actually make go into the, the, the Lincoln home itself. Um, boy, they come from all over. You're, you're probably right in, in Chicago and St. Louis being, being a large majority, but, but literally from all over the world they're coming. And, and of course, a large uh, percentage of those visitors come, um, as, as the Rangers will tell you, in April and May with, with school tours. Um, and how much does it cost to come here and visit the home? Well, the price is right. The tickets are free. Um, you get them at the visitor center with a time on them and, and go in the home. How far are we from the law offices? About a four block walk. We're here on 8th Street and the law offices are over on, on 6th and a couple blocks to the north yet. Thanks, Tim Townsend. We're going to meet uh, Cullum Davis at the moment. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Davis. Good morning, Brian. Tell us about the law offices. Well, the law offices occupy an important corner of downtown Springfield. And I'm sorry, good, good morning, uh, Brian. The law offices occupy an important corner of downtown Springfield, just across, literally across the street from the state capitol. Now we call it the old state capitol. And just a block away from the then Sangamon County Courthouse, where Lincoln argued literally thousands of cases. And just one floor above the federal courtroom which uh, was an important venue for Lincoln in the bankruptcy and other federal cases that he argued uh, during his period here. This particular room uh, was the, uh, court, or the law office rather, of Lincoln's second partner, Stephen Trigg Logan, and then also Lincoln stayed here when he took on a younger uh, partner, junior partner, William Herndon, in 1843. So this particular office is emblematic of the kind of um, room and uh, books and chairs and even a daybed that Lincoln used as a lawyer. When he was elected president in 1960, what kind of law was he practicing? He was a general practice trial attorney by and large, although he handled some so-called office or non-litigation work. His principal activity was in the courtrooms of Illinois and even occasionally outside of Illinois. Uh, a trial attorney, that was his strength, his great interest, and it was what uh, marked him as a particularly capable attorney. How long have you been working on the Lincoln Legal Papers? The Lincoln Legal Papers have been in operation now for 13 or 14 years. I've been with them for some 12 years, and we are on the threshold of publishing our first uh, product, a massive electronic edition in facsimile format of all of the more than 100,000 records that we have uh, identified pertaining to his law practice. What will people get and how do they get it when it comes out? Well, uh, late this year, the University of Illinois Press will issue the DVD-ROM uh, Complete Law Practice of Abraham Lincoln. It will exist on just three uh, compact discs uh, we've managed to squeeze uh, one and a half million facts of information and about a quarter million pages of handwritten documents onto three discs on DVD-ROM, which is a more compressed version of what is more familiar to people, namely CD-ROM. They will be able there to access information and images uh, from an enormous number of cases, some 5,000 cases and all kinds of other uh, non-litigation transactions. Uh, they'll be able to find uh, the names of people who participated in Lincoln's practice. They'll be able to search uh, certain issues uh, such as slander or disputes over slavery. Uh, they'll be able to look for uh, members of their family who may have uh, participated as jurors or witnesses in Lincoln cases. They'll be able to uh, search for the judgments in those cases, find descriptions of them. 
And in a vast reference section, they'll be able to uh, identify and learn about the lawyers who practiced with Lincoln, the, uh, the boundaries of the various court venues of Illinois, and a host of other information. Our guest, Colm Davis, is a graduate of Princeton back in 1957. He has a master's from the University of Illinois and a PhD from the University of Illinois, and is author of The Public and Private Lincoln, originally from Peoria. Let's take a call from Pocatello, Idaho. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Yes, uh, it's good to uh, watch your program. I really appreciate it. I'm wondering about the, uh, the platform of the 60s and 64 of the uh, Republican Party. How did they differ? Any uh, thing on uh, foreign policy and the platform? I think there was something about uh, 64 that was anti-slavery, anti-polygamy platform. You're more interested in 64 than 60, is that correct? Oh, either one. Both. Either one. I'm wondering how it evolved there. Colm Davis, are you familiar with the uh, platforms of the two parties back I, then? Of course I'm familiar with them. I would think that David Long would be more uh, qualified to speak in particular to the 1864 platform differences. He's not here, but let me just ask you in general, back in those days, what were the differences in the two parties? Can you well, obviously, the extension of slavery into the Western territories, in particular in 1860, was the crucial issue and the one that uh, most basically separated the two principal parties. What kind of a lawyer, uh, I'm talking about not uh, what kind of practice he had, but how would you rate Abraham Lincoln from what you know now uh, as a lawyer? Well, he uh, was never anything remotely approaching the stature uh, of uh, Daniel Webster, say. He was never a great constitutional theorist. He did argue a few cases in the United States Supreme Court and prepare some documents for Supreme Court cases. But essentially, Lincoln was a hometown general practice attorney who took any and all clients on all kinds of issues uh, covering the entire uh, gamut of legal actions in the uh, antebellum Illinois. He was a man of great stature in Illinois, and by the time that he was elected president in 1860, he was known professionally, that is to say as a lawyer, even on the eastern seaboard, so that he had earned a reputation as a very capable attorney, chiefly on the uh, work that he did representing and, uh, and suing railroads throughout uh, Illinois. He became quite a successful railroad attorney uh, during the latter years of his practice, and that earned him a reputation nationwide. So when he left the U.S. House of Representatives in, 19, in 1849, he, he did, had no public office until he was elected in 1860. That's correct. In fact, contrary to a lot of popular uh, imagery about Lincoln, he really gave up the, the life of uh, politics when he returned to Springfield in um, 1849. He didn't expect to be in public office again. The congressional term had been a rather unsatisfactory one for him. And he said thereafter that I've been dabbling in politics, but his real bread and butter and the preoccupation of his life in the 1850s, at least up until 1856, was the practice of law, at which he earned really a very handsome income and traveled widely on the Eighth Judicial Circuit twice a year for two or three months at a time. Uh, argued cases before the U.S. District Court in Springfield and later on in Chicago, and of course handled a good many cases before the Illinois Supreme Court, uh, which had its own chambers in the uh, state capitol building just across the street from his office. Our guest, Colm Davis, we go next to Springfield right here in Illinois. Go ahead, please. Hello. Welcome to Springfield. Thank you. Very nice to, to uh, I, I, I guess I'll tell you, I took the day off of work just so I could stay home and work this phone get through. Uh, nice. I'm not sure this is a, a real specific question for uh, Mr. Davis as he concentrates on Lincoln's work life. I've got uh, more of an interest in, in uh, the Lincoln's home life here in Springfield uh, because I've got ancestors on both my parents' sides of the family who had intimate relations and dealings with Abraham Lincoln. And one of them was a man named Stephen Eubank, Stephen Green Eubank, who was Lincoln's neighbor at the Globe Tavern. Maybe Mr. Davis could tell us what he knows about the Globe Tavern. And the fact that uh, this uh, society lady, uh, Southern Belle, Mary Todd, could have lived in a tavern. And uh, the social relations between her and the class of people living in the tavern, there's a legend in our family about uh, my great-great-grandmother being highly offended at being asked to babysit for the uh, Lincoln children. And this was a, uh, a class 
messing up, basically. And there's other stories. I've got a great uh, uh, genealogy that came from one of my cousins, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, seeing if I can verify some of the things that I found in it. A lot of it was compiled in the uh, 1930s. So I'll, uh, I'll let you go, and uh, uh, the question, I guess, is about the Globe Tavern. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Davis. Well, if the caller would contact us uh, separately at the Lincoln Legal Papers, um, area 217-785-9130, we could tell him whether the uh, ancestors of his actually interacted with Lincoln in the courts of Springfield. And it's quite possible they did. We have over 30,000 names of people who participated in Lincoln cases in one way or the other. But with respect to the Globe Tavern, it's important for the caller to understand that the word tavern had a different connotation in the 1840s than it has today. It was essentially a lodging place. It's true that meals and alcohol were serve, served at the Globe Tavern, but it was a place to live. And so it wasn't a disreputable institution for the young bride, Mary Todd, to have inhabited that or to give birth to her first child uh, at the Globe Tavern. Mr. Davis, how many lawyers would sit in that one office there? Well, there would be several attorneys sitting here. Lincoln was known to occasionally stretch out on the daybed and read the newspaper. Occasionally, particularly on Sundays, his children might visit here and cause uh, uh, some trouble, uh, mess things up a little bit, driving William Herndon to distraction on occasion. Uh, but there might be one or two lawyers. More commonly, a client would visit Lincoln in this office and ask for his services on a particular case. And uh, Lincoln would look up a few books, uh, uh, reference works he had. He had a, a set of Blackstone's commentaries and Chitty on pleading and other sources that helped him look at the law in this case. Or he might travel over to the Supreme Court Law Library across the street and look up some of the citations from uh, state rulings in other states or in Illinois that might pertain to a particular issue that he was handling. We can only see you where you're sitting. How big a room is that, please? This is a room that probably measures, I'm guessing, uh, 30 feet by 25 feet. There was also a clerk's room uh, adjoining this room. And uh, later on in his career, Lincoln also uh, had a, a, another room in this particular building uh, further uh, south uh, of here. But uh, it was a commodious room, actually, as, as such facilities go. Uh, he had plenty of space. And uh, he would chat here with his friends. It was a place where they might visit about politics or law or gossip around Springfield. Cincinnati, Ohio, you're next. Go ahead, Cincinnati. You're on with Mr. Cullum Davis. Hi, my question is, if Lincoln was elected pres was not elected president, would would the war still be fought? Mr. Davis? Well, that's one of those great if questions that historians try to avoid but can't resist making a half-hearted effort at answering. Uh, there very likely would have been a war had Lincoln not been elected, but that is conjectural on our part. And so uh, we, that isn't what happened. And so historians try to deal and describe with uh, what happened rather than what might have happened. What, in your opinion, was Mr. Lincoln's talent uh, when it came to writing itself? As we know, he's admired as one of the most literate, uh, if not eloquent, presidents in all of our history. And I think that's a fair judgment. Um, there's no doubt that his uh, work as a lawyer for some 25 years here in Springfield and around Illinois honed some of his talents for speaking and writing. Not that writing legal documents is a great preparation for writing the Gettysburg Address because those legal documents can be rather stylized in their form. But the sheer practice of debating and arguing and uh, penmanship and drafting uh, clear, lucid sentences was a wonderful experience for Lincoln to gain the ability to make a central point, a focus on that issue, clear away all the other verbal uh, garbage, and uh, develop an argument that was pointed and succinct, as indeed he did, of course, in the Gettysburg Address and some of the other great state papers for which he was responsible. If you've just joined us, welcome to our 16th in a series of 41 programs on American presidents. We're in Springfield, Illinois, one of 33 towns in America named Springfield, and we'll be here for the next hour and a half or so. C-SPAN school bus is there on the screen, downtown Springfield there in the background, and we're going to be with Cullum Davis here for a few more minutes talking about the Lincoln legal papers. Phoenix, Arizona, our next call. Go ahead, please.
Good morning, and thank you for having the most wonderful program on television. Um, I had been, um, I'm in my 60s, and back when I was in grade school, I had heard that Robert Todd Douglas had given testimony about his father's assassination in which he said that one of his uh, cabinet members, and I believe it was the Secretary of War, was involved in that assassination plot. Can you comment on that, please? I think our, thank you, and our caller misstated when she said Robert Todd Douglas, she meant Robert Todd Lincoln, uh, Mr. Davis. Well, uh, with the Lincoln assassination, as with every presidential assassination and other major events involving our presidents, there's a great deal of mythology and rumor, and uh, those rumors simply will not die. The, the notion that Secretary of War Edwin Stanton in some way conspired with or participated in a conspiracy to overthrow the government or assassinate Abraham Lincoln has surfaced every once in a while, uh, but historians have discredited that notion to their satisfaction, and uh, there is really no truth to it. When you published the Lincoln Legal Papers uh, later on this year. By the way, what month will it be, do you know? Well, it'll be the very early uh, month or two of, of the year 2000. We will finish the work, and the University of Illinois Press will market and distribute it in January or February of the year 2000. Do you know what it'll cost? Well, it's going to be expensive. This is essentially a product designed for research libraries. Uh, it, it's comparable, say, to these microfilm, microfilm editions of other great presidents. Uh, in our case, it would amount to some 120 reels of microfilm if we were publishing in that format. We can compress it all onto three discs. It will sell for in excess of $1,000 to libraries, though also uh, students of Lincoln and buffs of Abraham Lincoln or his law practice will be interested in acquiring this product as well. Is there material that hasn't been published that will um, shed new light on anything? There's a no doubt there's a great deal of new material. We visited over 150 courthouses and libraries and, and collections around the United States over a period of about eight years to find uh, every available surviving source pertaining to his law practice. We found literally tens of thousands of documents that hadn't yet been inspected. We found uh, actually hundreds of documents in Lincoln's own handwriting that were previously unknown to exist. And so there's a great deal of new material there. Many of those documents are fairly routine to a Lincoln buff, but will, have, but, but will be of great interest to any legal historian who's trying to reconstruct the minutiae of a law practice from those documents. But will there be, you know, so often when these uh, kind of things come out, there are news stories that come from it. Will there be new information that, you know, can you see a headline, Lincoln Papers reveal such and so? It's hard for me to, to guess that. We have already had a great deal of um, press and media attention from the discoveries we made from time to time, a, f a, a transcript of a famous murder trial here in Springfield in 1859, a, the longest document that Lincoln ever wrote that we discovered down in the Macoupin County Courthouse south of Springfield. So there's already been press accounts of major discoveries. Whether their publication in the form that we're making it will elicit a lot of other press gee whiz attention, I can't say. I suspect this will be regarded as a major publishing event in the annals of Lincolniana. Colin Davis, stand by for a moment. We're going to talk to a student from Lincoln, Illinois, about his high school, which is obviously named after Abraham Lincoln. His name is Jeff Leesman. He's in the 12th grade. Good morning, Mr. Leesman. Good morning. How are you? Okay. Can you tell us how your school in uh, Lincoln, Illinois, was uh, named after Abraham Lincoln? Sure. Well, um, originally the town here was Postville, Illinois, and Lincoln had surveyed land around the town and also heard cases in the courthouse there. And in the 1850s, the railroad was planning to be constructed between St. Louis and Chicago. And they had decided a station in this area would be, would be ideal because it's about halfway between St. Louis and Chicago. So the story is that three men had bought the land in order to lay out the town. And they hired Lincoln as their attorney because he was also attorney for the railroad and also a friend of theirs. And as they were in his office, drafting legal papers for the town. Um, he'd asked the men what they wanted to name their town, 
and they hadn't really thought about it. So they talked, and they decided they would call it Lincoln in honor of Abraham Lincoln, their lawyer. And supposedly, he was a. He really didn't know what to say. He said he didn't believe he'd do that. Um, he didn't really know anything named Lincoln, Lincoln that ever amounted to much. So how far, we, how far are you from Springfield? Uh, Thirty miles north. And and what year in school are you? I just graduated. What's next for you? I'll be attending University of Illinois. At uh, Champaign Urbana. Right. What are you going to study? Uh, engineering. We have on the screen right now a piece of watermelon, some kind of a monument. Where is that in your town? That's downtown, right next to the railroad. And that comes from, they were selling lots in town, and Lincoln was present. And he broke a watermelon and cut pieces for himself and the other three men that had laid out the town. And he poured juice on the ground and christened it with his name. What do you think of Abraham Lincoln yourself? Um, I think that, well, he's, of course, a great president and uh, a great man, and I think that everyone could probably look to him as an inspiration and someone who did the right thing. Jeff Leesman, thank you very much for telling us uh, about uh, Lincoln, Illinois, and before we let you go, tell us about Lincoln Community High School. How big is it? It's about 1,100 students. And uh, there's also an influence of Lincoln in that our nickname is the Rail Splitters, which comes from Lincoln, who worked as a rail splitter. And what about the college in town? And many kids uh, go from Lincoln Community High School to the college? Yeah, quite a few do. Um, and it's a two-year junior college named Lincoln College. So you can't get much more Lincoln than Lincoln Community High School, Lincoln, Illinois, and Lincoln College. Not really. Thank you, Mr. Leesman. Good luck to you. Thank you. We're going to come back with phones now to Willits, California. Cullum Davis is still with us, and the Lincoln Herndon Law Office is not too far from here. Go ahead, Willits, California. Yeah, my question is, how do you get information in regards to coming to visit these uh, historical monuments? And can they be sent to uh, me to see them? Uh, Mr. Davis, I know you don't run the, uh, the local uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce for the Lincoln sites, but uh, if you, from your experience in living here, if someone's coming from outside, how much is there to see and how would you go about learning about it? Well, the uh, caller should get in touch with, I believe it's called the Springfield Convention and Tourism Bureau which has all kinds of printed literature about the various Lincoln sites and other interesting tourist attractions in Springfield. Uh, there's a lot to see here. There is not only the Lincoln home from which you have broadcast and the Lincoln law office and federal courtroom and the old state capitol, but there is the railroad station from which he departed with his family in February of 1861 to become president. There was, of course, the Lincoln tomb in Springfield where his remains uh, are buried. And there is New Salem Village, uh, some 15 miles northwest of Springfield, where young Abraham Lincoln uh, struggled to find uh, a job and a career and kind of a direction in his life before he moved to Springfield in 1837. We're going to show some video of uh, New Salem. How far from this location at 8th and Jackson is uh, New Salem? I, I think it's uh, maybe 17 miles uh, northwest. And it's a wonderful site for families to visit because it has reconstructed uh, log cabins from the time that Lincoln was there in the 1830s, as you can see. Um, very interesting to uh, walk around New Salem Village. It's, it's easily a place where you could spend uh, half a day just touring uh, the various buildings um, uh, that are available there. Now, where did he learn how to be a lawyer? Lincoln actually learned, studied to become a lawyer in New Salem. Uh, he uh, wasn't able to go to law school. In fact, as many viewers know, he never attended more than a, a total of maybe one year of formal schooling. But he educated himself prodigiously because he had an extraordinary ambition to learn and to succeed. 
And he studied law books, he borrowed law books from an attorney in Springfield, John Todd Stewart, who later became his first uh, partner. And he read those books over and over again. He didn't even have the luxury of clerking for an attorney, which was a common means of legal education in those days, because there was no lawyer practicing in New Salem. At that time, Lincoln already was serving in the Illinois state legislature, but that only met once every two years. It did give him an opportunity to mingle with lawyers in Vandalia and later on in Springfield, but he essentially taught himself uh, the practice of law and practiced by writing out uh, simple legal documents before he actually was permitted to practice. For the last 12 years, our guest, Cullum Davis, has been director of the Lincoln Legal Papers. He's in the Lincoln and Herndon law firm offices down near the old state uh, uh, the state house. And we're going to go to Columbus, Ohio next. Good morning. You're on the air. Thank you. Good morning. First of all, I hope your wonderful series will be available to us through tapes or something so that we can show our grandchildren 50 years from now this wonderful show. Last summer, my wife and I had the wonderful experience of traveling both to New Salem and Springfield, and it would be worth it to anybody to go see those. I noticed in the home and I don't have any question but a comment. In the home, the home looks very similar to one we might find today, with the biggest exception being in the kitchen. That would be the biggest change I've seen in homes of today versus then. Also, if one goes and visits the Herndon Law Offices, the Lincoln Home, or the old State House, all the tour guides there are very knowledgeable and pleasant. And I guess my final comment, if a person wants to feel what democracy means, go to New Salem and Springfield and see the uh, place where our greatest president spent much of his time, and yet the town of Springfield has a small, warm, humble, a pleasant atmosphere, and you, you can see where our greatest president came from and how good it is still to see this kind of thing in America. That's Thank you, I caller. And on the screen right now, what you were seeing there was the Herndon uh, Lincoln Law Firm offices. Let me ask uh, Colin Davis the personal relationship between these two men. We've, there's a lot of copy been written over the years about them. How did they get along? Uh, between Herndon and Lincoln? Yes, sir. Uh, I think they got along really remarkably well. There has con been conjecture about how such different personalities could have interacted, but the fact of the matter is um, Herndon admired Lincoln a great deal. He was uh, Lincoln was the senior partner in this relationship. He was on the road a lot practicing law. Herndon tend to inhabit the office more. He was a more bookish figure than Lincoln, so he often looked up the citations and the precedents that would help Lincoln in deciding or arguing a case before the state Supreme Court. So Lincoln was kind of Mr. Outside, arguing cases in court. Um, Herndon was more Mr. Inside. Not exclusively, but largely that was the case. So they really got along well, and, and Herndon wrote a very admiring biography of Lincoln that scandalized some people because of some of the assertions he made about uh, Mary Todd Lincoln and uh, Ann Rutledge, uh, Lincoln's early alleged love. But the fact of the matter is, uh, Herndon's uh, interviews with people who uh, had known Lincoln and his own book about uh, Lincoln are remarkable sources for us to understand the nature of the man. Now, uh, Ann Rutledge uh, and Abraham Lincoln were uh, together when in at near New Salem? In New Salem. Ann Rutledge was a young woman in New Salem. Uh, they knew each other. It was a small village of just several hundred people. And uh, there was uh, s some reason to believe that they had some sort of romantic relationship, though she had committed herself to another gentleman who then left New Salem. There's no doubt at all that upon her tragic death at a young age, Lincoln went, went into very deep mourning. And that is one of the bases or the sources for the, the long prevailing notion that uh, she was his first uh, great love. And according to Herndon, she was his uh, greatest love. Arlington, Texas, for Cullum Davis. Good morning. Good morning. I have a philosophical uh, question for Mr. Davis. Are people who live during the presidency, uh, of one's presidency, more accurate, or do we rely too much on historians who, by their very nature of their positions, belong to either the AP or the NEA, which are, union and they, which are unions and therefore have a liberal bias? Now, no man was more ridiculed in the press than Lincoln when he was alive. Uh, so perhaps the Lincoln legend has been exaggerated. Now, the best example of this I can give, because I was alive when Harry Truman 
who was uh, president, was so unpopular with his contemporaries that he could never run for a second term. Yet, if you read historians, the legend of Truman via historians does not agree with people's views who lived uh, during the 1940s, uh, late 1940s. Now, is it the historians who are right, or the people, or uh, both? Well, I'll try to answer that question. Clearly, the caller has a point of view in, in asking it. Uh, let me simply say that um, historians have the advantage of uh, access to all of the sources, not just a particular point of view. And they also have the advantage of the passage of time, which gives them a perspective and a relative detachment. I don't think that it's fair to say that all historians are liberal in their bias or belong to certain labor organizations with a liberal bias. Historians try very hard by the nature of their craft and profession to take a look at issues objectively. That does not deny that uh, contemporaries of presidents have a unique perspective and we historians pay a great deal of attention to the contemporary views uh, and uh, newspaper accounts and uh, comments of people. But every great president has been defamed by the people uh, living at the time, and yet they were elected. Harry Truman may have been unpopular at the time, but he was elected, and the same is true of Abraham Lincoln. I think historians have been very fair in their assessment of Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Harry Truman, and they'll be fair in assessing the presidencies of the more recent presidents as well. We're going to move on uh, to the 17th president on July the 9th. Uh, if you're watching this live, it'll be a Friday. Andrew Johnson from Greenville, South, um, not Greenville, uh, not South Carolina, but Greenville, Tennessee, which is over in the eastern part of the state near the Tri-City area, Johnson City. Uh, and also, um, U.S. Grant will be July 12th on a Monday from the Grant Tomb in New York City up in the Upper West Side. And then uh, our 19th president, Rutherford B. Hayes, will be at his home in Fremont, Ohio. Uh, Ari Hoganboom will be our guest, and that'll be on Monday, July the 19th. See that run down there on your screen. Uh, Mr. Davis, can you show us on your computer there how this whole system will work and and uh, you, you said that it, it'll cost people about a thousand dollars but will they be able to go to a library and, and use it for nothing absolutely it'll be possible to access this information in any library that acquires the dvd rom and it's really very simple to do because of a unique interface and uh, software developed by my co-editor Martha Benner, it's possible to search for cases or subjects. In this case, uh, if someone were interested in railroads, they go to that subject heading and by typing in RA, we immediately pop up to railroads, which I put in the subject. And then I can simply ask a question of the entire database to show me all the cases involving railroads. And the database is searched quickly and we find out that there are 172 Lincoln cases involving railroads in one kind or another. One very interesting one that I'm familiar with is Barrett versus Al Alton and Sangamon Railroad. And we provide to the viewer a description of that case so that they can understand it quickly. We show that the various subjects that were covered in that, particularly contracts and breach of contract, and we show the two levels uh, that, were, uh, res uh, that were involved in hearing this case, both at the circuit court level and then the Illinois Supreme Court level. And we can get more details on that case, including the names of all of the participants, either by name alphabetically or by their role. And we see in this case, uh, Herndon and Lincoln were the plaintiff attorneys. The defendant attorney was uh, Stephen T. Logan, Lincoln's later partner. And over in this column, when it says yes, that means that you can find a biography of one of those other lawyers very quickly to assist you in that search. And then it's possible even to view some of the documents for that case. We have here a whole list of those documents. The letters are particularly interesting. For example, here I focused on one of the letters, which is a letter that Lincoln wrote, and I can zoom in to enlarge that. And it's really very clear on this. Uh, this is a letter to William Martin, who, as I recall, was the secretary of the corporation involved uh, the Alton and Sangamon Railroad. There are other letters as well, but you can see that it's possible for people very rapidly to find cases and subjects uh, as they might choose. Let me um, tell our audience that we're talking to Cullum Davis, who is the director of the Lincoln Legal Papers. He is over in the Lincoln Herndon Law 
firm offices over near the old state house and this will all be available to the public in the year 2000 from the university of illinois press we need to take a call one more at least two more calls for you one from mendota illinois go ahead please you're on the air with cullum davis yes brian i was wondering um in the LaSalle County Historical Society in Utica, Illinois, there's a carriage that was used by Lincoln in the Lincoln-Douglas debates in Ottawa. And because the railroads replaced the Illinois-Michigan Canal, I was wondering if Lincoln done any legal work for the Illinois-Michigan Canal. And also I would make a comment that that square right outside the law offices is the starting point for the Downer Party. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Yes, it's, it's true that Lincoln was involved in some canal litigation, though in his major role was as a, uh, an appointed commissioner, helping resolve some of the pending bills and contract disputes for the construction of the Illinois and Michigan Canal. So he did have some involvement there. He also visited Ottawa in connection with the fact that there was a period of time in Illinois' history when the Illinois Supreme Court was divided into three separate divisions, and he attended the Northern Division of the Illinois Supreme Court, which actually met in Ottawa, where the current uh, appellate court is located. Budlow, Colorado, next call, last call for our guest for this segment. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, Brian, thank you so much. This is a wonderful, wonderful series. It's one of the best on television. Thanks for watching. And I really appreciate it. I have a comment and then a question. First of all, for Ms. Norbert. Um, I believe it's disparaging for her to uh, be the curator and state that she is, uh, she does not, um, this is not her choice for work. Let her go get a job where she is, feels that she is qualified for somewhere else. And second of all, I would like more information on how you contribute to the Lincoln Library and um, ask if Miss Norbert will be involved in this. Thank you very much. Okay, fine, thank you. Do you have any, are you involved in the uh, Lincoln Library at all, Mr. Davis? Yes, I am. Uh, with Edna and other historians, I've been helping uh, conceive what sort of programming ought to take place inside the library that is designed and then constructed. And I can say that if the caller were to get in touch with the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency at Union Station in Springfield, Illinois, uh, we would be happy to receive contributions toward the construction of that uh, marvelous uh, library which is under design right now and which I think will serve uh, a great purpose uh, for the tourists and the researchers who come to enjoy its museum exhibits as well as its priceless collections of Lincolniana. When do you think people would be able to walk through the doors of a new Lincoln Library? Realistically, I suspect we're four or five years away from its completion, but there's no doubt at all that there's uh, serious activity underway already in the design of the exhibits and in the design of the building. Colin Davis, we're going to take a break. Thank you very much for sharing with us the new project and the history of the Lincoln Legal Papers. We'll talk some more. And we also want to thank Nikki Stratton of the convention group here who paved the way for us to come to town and been a big help to us. And Norm Helmers, again, who uh, runs the Lincoln Home for the National Park Service. There are lots of other people, Chet Rhodes and Bob Coomer at the law offices downtown, TCI, the local cable operator in this community. We're going to break and continue with David Long and Edna Medford in a moment.
Live again from Springfield, Illinois, which is uh, somewhere near the middle of the state of Illinois, the capital city. You can see the capital off there on the left, the C-SPAN school bus on the right. Abraham Lincoln's house from 1844 till the time that he left for the presidency in 1860-61, right there on the screen with some of the National Park Service Rangers there and on horses. And uh, Norman Helmers uh, runs this place with uh, a lot of help. Visitor center not too far away. The Lincoln Herndon Law offices available to the public downtown. And the gravesite, which is out at Oak Ridge Cemetery, where Abraham Lincoln, his wife Mary Todd Lincoln, and three of their four sons are buried. The fourth, Robert Todd Lincoln, and his son, Abraham Lincoln II, are buried at Arlington National Cemetery, not too far away from the William Howard Taft gravesite in Arlington National Cemetery. Our two guests continue here in our parlor room at the Lincoln home at 8th and Jackson include David Long and Edna Green Medford, two people who have thought a lot about Abraham Lincoln and I want to go back. We've talked a lot about him so far. It seems like three hours isn't enough to even open the first page to deal with him. When did the war start in, in some earnest and how many Americans were under arms in the early days, Edna Medford? Uh, the war started um, in 1861 uh, with the, fi uh, with the, um, the uh, South Carolina firing on Fort Sumter. When the war first started, Lincoln had asked for uh, 75,000 volunteers. He expected this to be a very short war. They were talking about perhaps 90 days, and I think Jefferson Davis did a similar kind of thing in terms of asking for volunteers, a few more. Uh, recruits than, than quite what Lincoln uh, had asked for, but no one expected the war to go on for as long as it did. Um, David Long, you pointed out earlier, 33 states in the Union at the time. How many were Southern? How many were Northern? Well, there were 15 slave states. Uh, I suppose that most of them could be considered Southern, Delaware, Missouri. Um, 11 states eventually seceded. Seven seceded before the firing on Fort Sumter. When Lincoln called for troops to suppress the rebellion, four more joined uh, the, that first seven. Four border slave states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, did not secede. Uh, and in, in some instances, as you've heard from previous callers, extraordinary measures were take to, taken to keep them from seceding, particularly Maryland. We have a call from La Jolla, California. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Yes, good morning, um, Brian. It's been a long time since I've been able to call in. Um, hope to see you, by the way, out here at the Athenaeum in La Jolla sometime. Thanks. Um, I have a question I'd really like to hear this gentleman, the historian, who I feel is one of the best you've had on. You've had some that I question uh, their accuracies, but um, I'd like him to really give a consent uh, explanation of the difference between what they call the Republican Party in Lincoln's time and what they call the Republican Party today, which I believe is should be called a conservative party, not the Republican Party. But and the Democrats of Lincoln's time and the Democrats of today, I believe that Lincoln believes in a very strong central government, number one, and number two, he's a trial lawyer, something that's vilified by Republicans today, of course. But there are many areas when I believe the Republican Party of Lincoln's time was certainly more like the Democratic Party of today. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for the call. Yeah, why don't we get both Edna Medford and David Long in on this one? Yeah. Uh, it, interesting observation. The, the Republican Party of Lincoln's era, which of course was the original uh, Republican Party, was certainly the progressive party, a political party of the nation at that time. It was founded as an anti-slavery party, founded as a party to oppose the continued uh, uh, joining of new states to the, to the Union that where slavery would be sanctioned by law. Um, the Democrats of that day, were, there was a party that was rooted in the South, that's where it was strongest. Uh, there, was, there was little democratic um, concern uh, about slavery, or about doing anything about slavery. There was a great deal of democratic uh, energy given to preserving uh, slavery. So the caller's uh, indication that, that seemingly politically, it's almost as though the parties have reversed themselves since that time is, is, has some merit. Some people believe that it, not that the Republican Party 
uh, changed that much, but rather the Democratic Party went from being a very conservative states' rights party then to, of course, in the 20th century, the party that is, is associated with, with a strong government and presence. Adam Efford, anything to add to that? Yes, we, we should keep in mind, too, that just as with today, people join these parties for a variety of reasons. So not all Republicans would have been anti-slavery, uh, and not all Democrats would have been pro-South. And so we have to remember that there was a great deal of sectionalism, um, a, a variety of people in both of those parties, and again, certainly that's reflected. Again, the number of people in the United States uh, of the 33 states, how, what was the total number back mm -hmm. in 1860? About 31 million people, all uh, total, uh, about 20, between 20 and 23 million of those in the North. The, North uh, the North's population had been swelled by immigration over the years. There are not a lot of immigrants coming to the South because they know they're going to have to compete with the labor of enslaved people. And so, um, in large measure, they stay away from the southern states. Colm Davis is still with us. We'll take a call from Red Hills, Tennessee. You're next. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. Thank you Hi. so much for uh, this series. Uh, speaking of sectionalism, um, there's, was, we have a little article each a week in our uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and called Countdown 2000, and this was just a small article, and um, it spoke about a young Confederate who, uh, on April 7, 1862, the second day of the Battle of Shiloh, he was captured, and after a few months in prison, he switched sides and served in an artillery outfit until he was discharged because of poor health. Then in 1864, he joined the United States Navy and saw action against Fort Fisher, North Carolina. His name was Henry M. Stanley. He became a newspaper correspondent, and he's famous for finding the English missionary David Livingstone in Central Africa in 1871. I just thought this was interesting because uh, most of the uh, people who... A lot of the men who fought for the Confederacy uh, were not um, slaveholders. They were mostly cannon fodder. And even though the Scots-Irish who settled this area would fight at the drop of the hat and all loved a good battle, uh, they were um, not as great an ideologue as uh, the uh, leaders of our southern states were. Please Thanks, comment. Uh, thanks, Red Hills. Uh, Colin Davis, any comment on this? Uh, only that uh, it, it certainly is true that the picture is a little more complicated than to speak of slave states and free states. In fact, in Tennessee itself, there were pockets of pro-union sentiment that's famous uh, in the Cumberland Gap area, for example, uh, that a Lincoln Memorial University was founded uh, later on as a result of the fact, in part at least, because citizens of the Cumberland Gap area had been loyal to the Union throughout the war. They weren't as dependent upon slavery, they were mountain people. And so, uh, as in all history, uh, the picture is a little more complicated than simple black and white. Sacramento, California, go ahead, please. I've always thought it was interesting that Robert E. Lee, and I believe his middle name is Edward, uh, has two names similar to two of Lincoln's sons, Robert and Edward. Uh, do you know of any writers who've made um, reference to those two um, interesting ideas? David Long. I know of no writer who has ever treated the subject. Uh, I, I'd never even thought of it myself before right now. <laughs> and to Medford, is there any way from your studying that you can get a sense, of, again, of what the relationship was between Abraham Lincoln and his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln? Uh, I mean, and, and how unbalanced was she? Uh, she probably did. Um, it's a possibility that she suffered from a mental illness. Uh, they were both very difficult to live with. And Lincoln himself had uh, bouts of depression throughout his life. Uh, they were very, uh, two very different personalities, and so they clashed uh, as a consequence of that. She was high strung, she was uh, very well educated, she was an aristocrat. And Lincoln, uh, although he was a self-made man and did, uh, uh, was able to rise uh, socially, through the years. Um, he certainly did not have the background that she did, so there was a clash there as well. Uh, I, I think that she, um, she probably had good cause for some of her, um, what's been considered outrageous behavior. He was never home, 
and I suspect that if he had been, if he perhaps had, um, had been there, things may have been different, who knows? But uh, certainly she cannot be blamed uh, totally for the relationship they had. I, I agree that it probably was a loving relationship, but there was tension there throughout their marriage. David Long, why did he not run for Congress again after uh, he was in for one term? An agreement that had been made before he ran for Congress in 1846 uh, involving some other uh, central Illinois poli um, politicians, uh, he really didn't have to, uh, to honor it, uh, but he did. And part of the character of Lincoln, we know, of course, is that uh, he was an honest person, he, and he, uh, if he made a promise, he, he lived up to it. He stepped aside to let somebody else run. David Long is a professor at East Carolina University in North Carolina, Greenville. Edna Green Medford is a Howard University history professor, has been there for the last 12 years. And Cullum Davis is in charge of the Lincoln Legal Papers, based here in Springfield. We go next to Irwin, Pennsylvania. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, hello, and thanks to all on C-SPAN for all this wonderful program. I would like for your historians, please, to comment on Lincoln's hand, President Lincoln's hand in uh, the promotion of his officers, if he could if they could compare his uh, leeway with perhaps his opponent, Jefferson Davis, and also uh, the, the reason that, that, that prompts this question is that I have a handwritten note uh, by Lincoln that says, uh, from much that I've heard at various times, and especially recently, I shall be very glad to promote Colonel Ingalls if it can be considered. And I always thought the wording of that note was rather curious. So how would this uh, uh, have uh, been? Got it. Ed and Medford. He was very much a hands-on president in terms of, of his generals. Um, even indicated to them instances in which they should use different strategy, uh, was very much involved in promotion, sometimes countermanded uh, orders, went over their heads, talked with subordinates. He was very much involved in this war effort uh, beyond, well, he, he, took, he took the whole title commander-in-chief literally, I think. David Long? Well, yeah, he, uh, uh, he had some bad experiences with generals fairly early on in the war at a time when he didn't take as much of a hands-on approach uh, that led him to believe that uh, oftentimes generals probably weren't going to be as aggressive as, would, uh, as he would have wanted them to be. What's the story about Abraham Lincoln visiting George McClellan and he refused to come down from his second floor <laughs> in his house? Yes. Uh, in, I believe it would have been November or December 1861, shortly after George McClellan had been made commander of all United States uh, military troops. Um, Seward and Lincoln and one of Lincoln's secretaries went to the house of McClellan. They had been trying to get some indication from McClellan when he was going to move, when he was going to do something. There was pressure being put on McClellan to take some action. They sat in his front parlor because he was out at a party at, a, at, a, uh, at some occasion. And he came walking in that evening. Uh, immediately his manservant uh, said, told him the president and the secretary of state are in the front room. McClellan proceeded to walk upstairs to the second floor. Well, the three of them continued to wait for him for some period of time. John Hay finally gets up and goes to the manservant and says, where is General McClellan? And Butler said, well, he, the general has gone to bed. Well, it's a uh, slight of the president that I'm not sure <laughs> There is a, there's an, an, another instance that I'm aware of that is quite as uh, glaring as that one. Uh, Let me ask the three of you in a moment uh, what one book, if you had to recommend one book, you would to people that don't know much about Abraham Lincoln and they want to get just a broad overview. We go t next to uh, Manhattan Beach, California. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I really love the program. Uh, Ms. Medford said that uh, Lincoln was not... Uh, he didn't believe uh, very much in organized religion, but uh, several years ago we were on a tour in Washington, and we attended the church where Peter Marshall, a uh, famous minister, uh, had preached. And um, uh, Catherine Marshall, um, we sat on the Lincoln bench, and um, and uh, they gave us a tour afterward. And uh, anyway, I had read that Catherine Marshall said that look through the records. 
of uh, the attendance at that church, and that Lincoln had attended the church a number of times. So, <laughs> anyway. Edna Medford, what your he, he certainly does attend church rather regularly as a child um, with his parents, but uh, as an adult, he does not do that. He never does join a church, and so uh, that doesn't mean that he wasn't um, very much involved with study of the Bible, but certainly would not be considered uh, a church-going adult. Colm Davis, let me ask you about that book. Uh, you have one that would be your favorite you'd recommend well, to somebody? Well, as you know, Brian, there's hundreds and thousands <laughs> of titles to consider, but my personal favorite is the most recent serious biography of Lincoln. It's by David Donald. It's simply called Lincoln. And it came out, what, maybe four or five years ago. It's a best-selling book. It's not an easy biography to read. Uh, Donald doesn't hand you ideas on a silver platter, but that's one of its virtues. He simply lays out a, a definitive uh, account of Lincoln's life and uh, develops a theme about a relatively passive individual, but also touches on all of the aspects of Lincoln that really make him so fascinating to all of us today. David Long, is there one by him? Cullum's, Cullum's absolutely right about Professor Donald's volume. Uh, he's also correct in, in that the interpretation of Lincoln uh, as a passive president uh, is, that Professor Donald gave is, is one that I and a lot of other Lincoln historians have some trouble with, but it's still a marvelous biography. I would also say uh, Benjamin Thomas's uh, the volume. The one I have right here. Yeah, this correct. is one you can buy fairly inexpensively. Right. Right. And, and, uh, and Stephen Oates, uh, with Malice Toward None, is a very good biography of Abraham Lincoln Ed as well. Medford, do you have a quick recommendation? It's very difficult to choose just one because he was such a complex individual, but uh, certainly David Herbert, Herbert Donald's uh, Lincoln biography is, is one of my favorites. But I, I would uh, suggest, too, that uh, readers need to look at uh, a separate volume done by an African-American. And that book, uh, for, for me, would still be Benjamin Quarles' Lincoln and the Negro. East Hampton, New York, you're next. Oh, good morning. You've got a wonderful program. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the emancipation of the slaves in the District of Columbia. Uh, I have a collection of, of, of put together over many, many years of medals relating to uh, uh, emancipation of the slaves. And this one is a very crude one, and it's stamped on it, Great Joy to Our Race, the Emancipation Bill passed April 16, 1862, Washington, D.C. Now, I know the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, was passed, was uh, signed by uh, Lincoln in January 1st of 63. Was there any bill in 1862? And the Medford? I, I, I'm not quite understanding a bill for what specifically? Emancipation to, for, 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 the, for the larger emancipation. Yeah. Uh, what Lincoln is doing fairly early in the war, at, at least by the end of the first year of the war, he's attempting to get the border states to emancipate on their own. And so he's constantly at Congress to, to uh, well, he's, he's at the individual states. For instance, he's attempting to get Delaware to do it, first and foremost. And then he's urging uh, Congress. Uh, there are uh, a variety of emancipation measures that do occur. Uh, starting with the first, uh, first Confiscation Act of 1861, in August of 1861, then there's a second Confiscation Act in 1862, in June, I believe, of 62. Colum Davis, uh, if I counted right, he had, uh, Mr. Lincoln had five appointments to the Supreme Court. That number tracked with I you? I believe that's correct, yes. We can, uh, we'll find the uh, slide and put it up on the screen. What impact did he have on the Supreme Court from what your knowledge is of uh, his legal history? Well, of course, those appointments were important ones, and that, that's his principal impact. He was deferential toward the Supreme Court and its autonomy, just as he was, by and large, toward Congress and its legislative autonomy. Uh, one of his major appointments, of course, was of his good friend, David Davis, who had presided over the Eighth Judicial Circuit when Lincoln rode that circuit in the 18, late 1840s and 1850s. But uh, those appointments to the Supreme Court shaped it for years to come, and uh, it was in that sense that he had an influence. I don't believe that he ever tried to shape its own thinking. Uh, few presidents have, and those who have have sometimes uh, come to some grief in doing so. But those five appointments were important. Colm Davis is at the Lincoln Herndon Law Firm offices down across from the old state capitol here in Springfield, Illinois. 
If you've never been to this part of the world, and we've mentioned it earlier, you're only about a three and a half hour drive from Chicago. It's all interstate, I-55, and the same is true coming from St. Louis, although the timing is only about 90 minutes or so. Edna Medford and David Long are here in the house at 8th and Jackson here in Springfield. You can see on the screen the uh, relative uh, towns uh, in, in Mr. Lincoln's life. Another one is Charleston, which is not on that map, where his uh, father Thomas is buried near there. And his mother is, is buried, uh, Nancy Hanks Lincoln, in Lincoln City down in southern um, Indiana. Uh, and we go next to Tracy, California. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Uh, Hi. I have one comment and two questions. Uh, my comment, I wish to recommend to the Lincoln aficionados the 1992 ABC TV movie called Lincoln, in which a story is uh, shown through photographs and voiceovers by uh, Jason Robards, Oprah Winfrey, and Richard Dreyfuss. It's a very nice educational film. Uh, also, the accompanying musical uh, CD soundtrack by Alan Menken is also very good. Uh, my two questions. First, um, do you have what other information do you have on uh, Robert Lincoln's son, such as um, his age at the time of his death? And my second question is, um, in speculation saying that uh, Lincoln served his uh, second term, how would he have fared with the um, Reconstruction issue, which later brought Andrew Johnson? I don't see how he would have succeeded in getting anything uh, passed with the uh, radical Republicans. Um, I'll take the answer on the air. Thank you very much. Let's go to the Reconstruction first, uh, David Long. Okay. Been one of the real uh, uh, um, contentious issues among Lincoln historians over the years as to what uh, what Lincoln would have done had he had he lived to be president during Reconstruction. Uh, certainly, anybody who was president during Reconstruction was going to have difficulty. Uh, it was a difficult time. Of course, it was made all the more difficult by the uh, the, the very the, the, the very tense, and it even got ugly, situation between Andrew Johnson and the uh, radical Republicans in Congress. Lincoln would not have had uh, that much difficulty with the radical Republicans. He had handled them pretty well during the war. My inclination, I was just talking with Edna about this a little while ago, is that Lincoln would have been much more involved in assuring that the gains for the freedmen, for the former slaves, uh, would be preserved and that their safety uh, would be secured. Um, of course, there's no way of knowing. Um, of Let me uh, show the audience uh, the uh, cemetery, the Oak Ridge Cemetery, which is not very far from here, where uh, Mr. Lincoln and his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, are buried. There you can see the obelisk, which, by the way, this has all been changed a couple of times. That was actually heightened a number of years ago uh, from where, the, where it is right now. And buried here are the three of his four children and Mary Todd Lincoln. He was originally buried in a vault down below in the back of this area uh, for six months, then moved to the side of the hill, then moved here where you can see uh, the designation. Eddie died in 1850. He was four years old at the time. Uh, Willie, you can see, died in 1862, which was uh, three years before the president was shot. And uh, Tad Lincoln lived until 1871. And Robert Todd Lincoln, I want somebody to pick up on in this at this point. Tell us uh, what he went on to do and how many years did he live? Edna Medford or um, Colum Davis? I, I certainly don't remember uh, when his son uh, may have died, but he went on uh, to, well, one, one very important thing he did was to uh, head the, the Pullman uh, Company after uh, its founder died. Uh, I'd like to very briefly address, however, the whole issue of what Lincoln might have done had he uh, survived. Uh, Hold on just a second because I don't know we have the more videotape left of the grave area. I want to make sure that we see the entire part of this. Cullum Davis, do you know anything more about Robert Todd Lincoln and uh, when he was Secretary of War? Well, he was, as you say, Secretary of War. He also was a very successful uh, corporate attorney, founded a, an important law firm in Chicago which survived by the name uh, Isham, Lincoln, and Beale until maybe 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, he had a summer home in, uh, what is it, New Hampshire, I believe, Hildeen, uh, was a very successful, financially successful person. Temperamentally, he couldn't have been more different from his father. He was a rather cold, austere figure, um, not beloved the way uh, his father had been. And the Medford, uh, had he lived? 
Yes, uh, I, I'm, I'm not quite as optimistic as Professor Long that uh, Lincoln would have uh, done anything very different from what Johnson did. In fact, Johnson initially is following Lincoln's plan of Reconstruction. Lincoln proposes before his death a 10% plan uh, suggesting that uh, when 10% of the voters from uh, 1860 for any uh, seceded state declares its loyalty to the Union, then that, that's one of the provisions by which that state could re-enter the Union. Um, it's a very conciliatory plan, and all he does basically in terms of um, holding out any kind of hope for African American involvement in politics or, or um, inclusion in American society is a letter that he sends to Governor Hahn uh, of Louisiana suggesting that perhaps uh, the more intelligent uh, of African Americans and those who had served uh, in the war might be given the right to vote but he doesn't go beyond that. Uh, certainly there's a possibility that he would have eventually, but he doesn't show that uh, by the time of his death. By the way, if you've just tuned in, this is all you've ever seen on C-SPAN of Lincoln. Uh, you, you should know that these programs are all being repeated at 8 o'clock on Friday nights, but we have had hundreds of hours of Abraham Lincoln over the last 20 years, and uh, a lot of it's available in our archive, and a lot of it will be played in addition to this three-hour program on Friday night, so you can see uh, other things, including Harold Holzer's tour uh, of, the, of the exhibit at the Lincoln Museum in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Bradenton, Florida, you're next. Go ahead, please. Well, I wanted to thank you. I don't want to bother you historians. I wanted to thank you for uh, reminding me of my history. I carried papers at Lincoln's home back in 1940 for the afternoon paper you showed a picture of uh, Lincoln's tomb did you see this shiny nose he had people rub that for luck when they went in to sign it say I walked the Lincoln Trail maybe a half a dozen times you screwed up one of my uh, trivia questions uh, who was Lincoln's vice president because no one ever knew about Hannibal Hamlin and uh, for your gentleman downtown I was in offices in the Myers building the Illinois building and another I used to look at the courthouse all the time and I wanted to thank you for my history lesson. Thank you for the call. We'll go to Belding, Belding, Michigan. Go ahead, please. I wanted to tell you that you were discussing earlier the states that were free and which ones were slave during the Civil War. When um, Alabama was a southern state, but the county of Winston said that if, if Alabama could secede from the Union, then they could secede from Alabama. So they were known as the free state of Winston, and still are. It, it's in, uh, more in the northern part of Alabama. Thanks. David Long? There was, a, as, as Colm indicated earlier, there were pockets of Union sympathy throughout the South. Uh, the, probably the best known area, of course, was eastern Tennessee, resulting eventually in Lincoln Memorial University there. But there were areas of northern Alabama in particular um, that strongly supported the Union. Areas of western North Carolina, for example, and of course West Virginia was, was part of Virginia until the western counties chose to break away from Virginia. Colm Davis, what did, um, from what you're reading in all of Abraham Lincoln, what did he sound like? Well, let me, if I may first, uh, Brian, comment uh, further on um, David's uh, observation. The opposite is true as well. There were pockets of pro-slavery sentiment throughout the North, including, I might add, Sangamon County, Lincoln's home county, which uh, was not all that enthusiastic about his presidential campaign in either 1860 or 1864. Uh, now I've, of course, forgotten your question. No, I was just, it, these are just personal <laughs> questions. Uh, how tall was he? Oh, he was, what, six feet four inches tall. He had a rather high uh, pitched voice, actually. Not squeaky exactly, but not the basso profundo that many actors have uh, laid upon him. Uh, he uh, uh, had something of a uh, rural twang to that voice, and some people even think of it or thought of it as a rather southern uh, dialect. So it wasn't the kind of vo voice that automatically attracted attention and respect. It was the words that emanated from that voice that made the difference. Now, this is a question I don't know that I've ever asked before about the, somebody that uh, way back when. Do you have any idea what his handshake was like? Anybody here, David Long? Everything, well, I, everything I'm led to understand is it was a very firm handshake. I think of... Uh, January 1st, 1863, the day that he's going to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, there has been a White House reception that morning. Of course, this is an important occasion. He has shaken the hands of hundreds of people. 
And at noon, when they go up into the, uh, at what would then be the executive office, what in the Oval Office then, uh, he picks up the pen with all of these dignitaries around, picks up the pen to write the emancipation, or write his signature, and his hand is trembling. And he puts the pen down and turns and says, you know, if, if, um, if my name goes into history, it will be for this act, and I want everyone to know that I firmly believe it. If, uh, if my hand seems to shake when I sign it, then people will, throughout history, say he didn't really know if it was the right thing or not. He said, I've been shaking hands all morning. My hand is numb. He said, and now he reaches down a second time, picks the pen up, his hand is steady, and then he signs it. But that's just one instance of, of where his handshake has, uh, it, we know something of, of what it did to him in that occasion. Colm Davis, Edna Medford, and David Long, if you'll stand by for a moment. Linda Norbert Suits is back with us with uh, some more views of the house here. Where are you now, Linda Suits? I'm heading up the front stairs. We left, when I left you last, at the front door. And there were stairs behind me, and we're going up those stairs up into Lincoln's bedroom. Um, this, when the house was made a full two stories, this became Mr. Lincoln's bedroom. Um, and this is where he uh, slept in the evening. Uh, behind me is a desk where he could do some work uh, when he was up here. But my favorite part of this room is the shaving mirror that's to my right. Lincoln, as you said, um, was six feet four inches tall. This is set for a man of six feet four inches tall. Can you stand over there next to it so we can get an idea of how, uh, and how tall are you? Um, I'm probably about 5'11". Get over there near a little, a little closer to it, and he say he was six four, so yes. he would look right into that mirror. Right into that mirror, and he shaved every morning. He was clean shaven the entire time he lived here. It was not until shortly before he left for Washington that he grew the beard. So he he used his razor every morning. He sharpened it here every morning. He looked in this mirror and he shaved himself. Um, he tried to comb back his hair. He said to have unruly dark. Uh, coarse hair, and he talked about his dark coarse hair, and even in his photographs, um, early ones, you can see it's, it's mussed up a lot. Um, so it would be here that he'd be trying to put it down in the mornings to make it behave before he went out. Um, and I can even see Mary, who, who shared the room next door, um, coming in and having him bend low over her because she was only five inches, five feet four inches tall, and trying to smooth his hair down in the morning before he went out to make it presentable to the world. One of the things I want to ask you about is that carpeting up there, or rug, or whatever you call that, and I, maybe Greg Faber can get a real good close shot of it to... Uh, and that, that's, that gray carpeting off to the right is stuff that you've put down for uh, visitors here. But uh, what is this? This is called ingrain carpet. Um, these were chosen, um, they're patterns from the time period. We don't know exactly what kind of carpet the Lincolns had, but this was popular at the time period. Um, and it's a woven wool carpet that lots of folks would have, would have had in their house. Um, and you look at the carpet and the wallpaper, and a lot of people uh, sort of gasp at the color combinations and pattern combinations. Um, but it was something very popular at the time period. This wallpaper we point out to everyone. This is the uh, reproduction of the exact paper that Mary Lincoln chose for her house. When this second story was added, uh, she purchased this paper for these rooms. Um, and I think it says a lot about Mary, the, the pattern. Now, she suffered from migraines, and a lot of people say they know why when they see this paper because of the wild pattern. Um, but this was something that she appreciated, and it was an expensive paper. Um, Lincoln's uh, law practice was doing really well, and uh, he could afford a paper that perhaps even came from France. It's hand-blocked. Um, and put this throughout his room, and we show it in uh, her room as well. They had a suite of rooms. Let me ask you about this, uh, and of course this would be the 1999 question. Uh, did they sleep in the same room, uh, the same bed, or do we care or do we know? They did until they added the second story and the back of the house that allowed them to have a suite of rooms. Um, it was a common practice of the time that uh, to have a suite of rooms. Uh, Mary's sister, Elizabeth, uh, who was married to the son of the territorial governor, also socially very prominent in Springfield, had separate rooms from her husband. Um, so it was something that if you could afford it, you did. It was always very practical for the Lincolns. Uh, he worked into the evening. She liked to uh, read into the evening. And she also suffered from migraines. So it was a place where she could go um, in quiet and dark when she was suffering from migraine. We had a call earlier, and I didn't 
I must say I didn't understand it completely because I guess I didn't hear what you said earlier, but there was some criticism of you and some, a statement you made earlier. Did you hear that call? No, I didn't. There's something to the effect, uh, did you say anything about this would not be your choice of work earlier? You remember saying that when, uh, Edna Medford, do you, do you remember that call? Uh, what she said was that she hadn't planned to do that, but I got the impression that she was very pleased that she was involved in this. But no, I, I didn't hear that she said she, uh, this would not have been her choice. But the caller seemed to be criticizing our guest, uh, Linda Suits. I just wanted to make sure you give me a chance to react to this. Uh, you've done this for eight years, and is it something that you wanted to do for eight years? Oh yes, I enjoy it very, very much. I've learned a lot working here. Um, and uh, it's just a lot of people um, set their sights on being a Lincoln Scholar and that was never, never my goal, but I enjoy every minute here and I've learned a lot and feel privileged to have been able to work here. But you are giving this up. Yes, I am. What are you going to do? I'm going to stay home for a little while with my children. Um, my husband and I and my family have talked about it for a long time and uh, we think that my little people at home are, are the uh, real important thing right now and that's what uh, I'm going to do for a little while. And they are six and, and four. Six and four. And what else can you show us before we wrap this part of our little tour up? Um, we can just walk into uh, Mary's room. It's a little bit more of an intimate feel in here. The ceiling is lower, it's 9 feet, it's 11 feet in Lincoln's room, um, so it's a little bit more of a closed-in feel. And there were stoves in these rooms that made them warm. And Mary also, she sewed a lot for her family, and we also illustrate a sewing table in this room because of all the sewing that Mary did. Again, we talked about this earlier, but what was the relationship, do you think, uh, between the two of them, and did it ever sour for a very long period of time? Um, there were rough spots. There were rough spots, I think, in most people's marriage. Um, she could be difficult. He could be difficult as well. I mean, there were lots of complaints that uh, he never came home time for dinner. Um, he, uh, they'd send the boys frequently to come and get him, and he'd sort of ignore the boys, and the, the dinner would be charred. There's another account that uh, he was watching the boys one day, um, had them in a wagon and was walking up and down the street and was reading a book and one of the children fell out of the wagon and he didn't notice because he was so wrapped up in other things. So I think that says a little bit about how he could become wrapped up in other things and not pay attention to what was going on around him, which would be hard for her. What's the difference between uh, the way that Mary Todd Lincoln related to the four boys in her family and the way he did? Um, they're both very uh, close to their children. Um, I, I think they had a, a similar feeling for how to raise children. Um, they were both very indulgent, um, and they loved their children very, very much. From all the tours you've seen come through here, what is the favorite thing for young people when they walk through this house? Um, for young people, actually, a lot of them, it's the privy in the backyard. They haven't seen anything like that before, and they're, they're real intrigued to see that. Um, and inside the house, uh, it, although it is not Abraham Lincoln's house, hat, uh, I think it's the hat downstairs they like a lot, too. When did this, uh, in, in, in our society, when would a, a house like this have indoor plumbing? Um, it depended on the family. Uh, it came in in different, different times depending on when you could afford it, but it would have been later in the century. Although uh, gas lighting was slowly creeping its way towards this uh, house in this neighborhood, and it would have been sh just shortly after the Lincolns left that gas would have been available for the inside of the house. Linda Norbert Suits, thank you very much for taking us on a little bit more of a tour. You're very welcome. We're going to go back to the phones. Cullum Davis is downtown at the law offices. Edna Medford is here in our parlor area of the house along with David Long and we go to Vienna, West Virginia. Go ahead, please. Hello, Vienna. You're Hello. on the air. <laughs> Hello, Brian Lamb. Hi. I'm in my seventh decade and yet I consider you a mentor. <laughs> I enjoy C-SPAN so much in my retirement years and I just want to tell you one thing. I have no question. I want to tell you that I visited as a young man, the Lincoln tomb, and for some reason, I think it was raining hard, I was the only one in that room with the tomb, and I still remember it vividly, and, and I, I, I don't know, it was just a wonderful experience. And uh, more power to you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks. Actually, I was out there yesterday and there wasn't anybody else around, although they get about 300,000 visitors um, a year. Uh, Colin Davis, I'm sure you've been out there. What strikes you about the tomb area? It, it's an impressive facility and a very handsome uh, cemetery. 
And uh, there is something almost mystical about entering the actual tomb area itself. It's rather uh, dimly lighted. There are uh, replicas of some of the statuary for Lincoln. And I think as you enter the actual crypt area, it, uh, anyone is profoundly affected by the sense of Lincoln's uh, greatness. The next call comes from Massachusetts. How do you pronounce the name of your town? Okay, it's called uh, Winchenden Springs, Massachusetts. Good morning. What would you like to uh, okay. comment on? Okay, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, earlier in the program, there was a mention about Lincoln's net estate. And I have a book here called 20 Days, which was pub uh, written by Dorothy Meserve Cunhart and Philip B. Cunhart, Jr. And then that book, they mentioned his net estate in April 1865, amounted to $83,342.70, exclusive of his home in Springfield, which was assessed at $3,500. And now also in that book, they mentioned a little dog he had by the name of Fido, which was a yellow dog, and the dog had to be left behind when they went to Washington, D.C. The family decided it would be too much of a burden taking the dog with them. So I want to thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Uh, David Long, do you have any idea what $83,000 would be worth today? Oh, he would have been, he would, that would be the equivalent of being a millionaire today, clearly. Um, but there's stories about um, Mrs. Lincoln ended up with no money. and Well, she had, she had a great deal of difficulty. After that, there, was, there, was, there were challenges on the, on, on the, the estate. Uh, she had trouble uh, getting money out of the estate. She would later petition congressmen. Uh, to to bail her out of situations that she was in, yeah, she uh, she didn't, um, and she did a fair amount of traveling in the years afterwards. I'm not sure how much of the money would have been eaten up by that. She had, of course, a very ill son, Tad, uh, that had to be taken, who had to be taken care of. Um, I, I'm not sure I can give you a real good answer as to why she had the problems she did financially, but certainly she did. Los Alamos, New Mexico. Next, good morning. Good morning. I want to thank you for your excellent programming. I have a question on Robert Todd Lincoln. We visited his home uh, in Manchester, Vermont, and I wondered if C-SPAN was going to visit. And then they titled the state as Hill Dean. It's a beautiful estate. Yeah, thanks for the call. We have been there before, but undoubtedly we'll go back. It is located right uh, outside the little village there of Manchester and Robert Todd Lincoln. I think one of the interesting stories I remember telling is when William Howard Taft came to visit him. He was about 300 pounds at least at that point, and they used to put the bed on the floor because uh, he couldn't get in the bed. And then in the morning, you have to bring people in to get him up, pull him up uh, from the floor. Have anybody that uh, on the program is, Mr. Davis, have you been to uh, Hildane? No, I haven't, uh, Brian. I have not visited. How about the folks in this room? I think I asked earlier. Let's go on to Silver Spring, Maryland next. Go ahead, please. Yes. Um, when I was a very, oh, wait a minute, let me put them on mute. When I was a young college student, I had a friend who uh, went to Dartmouth, and uh, he said that a history professor of his had said that the eloquence and brilliance of Abraham Lincoln was due to the fact that his mother, Nancy, was the illegitimate daughter of Patrick Henry. I have never, ever heard that story again, but I wondered if anyone else knew anything about it. Ed Thank Medford. you. Ford. There has there has been a lot of uh, question about who she was exactly. Uh, we only know about her mother. We don't know who her father was. Uh, not just Patrick Henry has been mentioned, but Thomas Jefferson and a lot of other people. John yes, a, a lot of historians, well, some historians <laughs> have suggested that uh, she descended from a prominent Virginia planter and that she was illegitimate. Uh, and Lincoln himself allegedly told Herndon that he feared his mother was illegitimate and that was a great source of embarrassment to him but at the same time according to Herndon uh, Lincoln felt that any kind of intelligence that he got came through his mother as a consequence of her having been fathered perhaps by this Virginia gentleman but of course we really don't know. Costa Mesa, California, go ahead please. Yes, good morning Brian, thank you for this series. Um, I had two thoughts to ask your uh, group guests about in many photographs of Lincoln, his hair is parted on the left side, but there are a couple, it's on the right side. And I know it's not an error in reversing the printing because the mole is on the right side of his face. Could, his, uh, could your guest comment, please? Tell him, Davis, do you have any idea? Uh, Brian, I haven't the slightest idea <laughs> as to Lincoln's habits in parting his hair on the right or the left. I'm sorry. 
Well, as somebody who's on. always had pretty unruly hair myself, I, I, I can say there are days that you wake up and your hair do, insists on not doing what you want it to do. You end up doing the best you can to uh, cause it to lie down, to not, to not be unruly. I think there were probably days that uh, it was easier to make it go in one direction than in the other. Let me ask uh, uh, off subject that we're talking about right now. Anybody can jump in on this. Uh, Mr. Lincoln was a captain in the Black Hawk, Black Hawk during the Black Hawk War. Uh, he also had a position he took on the Mexican War. Uh, Mr. Davis, anything on that from you, the Black Hawk uh, involvement? Well, that was an important experience in his uh, adolescent, early adult life. He volunteered to serve when he was living as a, as a newcomer in New Salem Village. And uh, one of the important things about it is that he was quickly elected to lead his particular military detachment, which is an early sign of his leadership potential and uh, stature. Uh, for him, it was uh, an interesting experience. Uh, he later laughed that he didn't really learn anything militarily about it, but that he did fight some uh, mosquitoes and suffered uh, from uh, the uh, walking around uh, southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois. Uh, he didn't develop an anti-war feeling from that, though it is certainly true that he was very critical of the administration's policy toward Mexico, uh, n namely President Polk's policy, uh, with the famous spot resolution that he had introduced in Congress. So some might have thought from that that he was a pacifist, uh, which isn't fair to say, obviously, in light of the Civil War experience, but he was very critical of the administration's uh, more or less um, uh, contriving, in his view, uh, a war with Mexico. And to Medford, we had uh, a caller ask about this portrait earlier. What is it? It's um, uh, a charcoal drawing, I believe, by Charles White, uh, the Harlem Renaissance, um, African-American Harlem, Harlem Renaissance artist. And certainly it does reflect uh, its artistic license. Uh, White is um, drawing Lincoln in the way that he sees him. Uh, the person who brought that in does indicate that there are some features that would suggest that he has, uh, he's of African-American descent. Uh, I think it's simply the artist uh, just giving his version of, of, of his Lincoln. And I'm holding this so you can see. If we pull back, Garrett, you can give the audience an idea of how, uh, how big this is. That, uh, and I guess you can pull back a little bit farther if you can. I don't know, uh, so we can see how it relates to a human being. There we go. It's a nice big portrait. We go to Niles, Michigan next. Go ahead, please. Um, yes, I had heard um, rumors that Abraham Lincoln was a closet homosexual is this true uh, it is not a rumor there's been some <laughs> recent developments in this area mr. long yeah there are uh, specific allegations or uh, uh, claims have been made that uh, coming from where um, the, I, I'm not that familiar with the person I know the Larry person Kramer. Larry Kramer has had I, I guess a, a history of involvement in some causes uh, that that um, center around homosexuality and gay movement um, my first reaction is, uh, so what? <laughs> uh, I don't know that anybody can say with absolute certainty what, what Lincoln's sexual orientation or practices were. Uh, nobody uh, s knew him personally, who's, who's with us today, and he didn't uh, reveal those things in his public statements or his private uh, utterances. I, but w if, if so, would it make the Emancipation Proclamation any less important? Let me ask Colin Davis, uh, one of the allegations includes a man named Joshua Speed who is from this area. Do you know much about him and do you know anything about this story? Yes, so Lincoln befriended Joshua Speed when Lincoln moved to uh, Springfield in April of 1837 uh, about to practice uh, law and he actually uh, rented space from Speed above Speed's uh, store on the square and in fact they did share a bed. Well, what of course has to be remembered there is the same point I made about the Globe Tavern that the notion of men sharing a bed in the 1840s or 30s is far different from the notion today. Do was, I remember correctly that uh, Stephen A. Douglas and, and Abraham Lincoln shared a bed in Galena? 
I don't know about that, but I do know that on the Eighth Judicial Circuit, when the lawyers rode that circuit with Judge Davis, they would stay in inns and taverns in various county seats, and there would be two or three or four men sharing the same rope bed in the attic of some inn. So it's, it's erroneous to draw inferences from that. I would agree with David Long that in terms of his presidency, it doesn't really matter, but I would also say that the person who has leveled this uh, claim uh, seems to have a political reason would have a political reason for doing so and he has stated that he has a document namely a Joshua Speed diary I think he called it but he's refused to show that to other historians and so the the skeptic in me as an historian says show me the proof and then I'll make a comment Harwich Massachusetts out in Cape Cod go ahead please my name is Hayes Jim Hayes and uh, you're touching on Lincoln's uh, lineage and his mother prompted this question. Uh, I've read uh, Carl Sandburg's three volumes on Lincoln, and in the first one, they, he traces from their, the uh, ancestors landing in Massachusetts, and actually there's a, uh, a statue of Lincoln in a little town, Hingham, where I live, uh, to substantiate some of these facts. And from there, there was migration into Virginia. And uh, this would be Lincoln's grandfather, who was persuaded there to go west. And uh, in his efforts, I guess, just before he started, they were in the farming, and there was Indians in the, involved. And he had three sons, did Lincoln's grandfather. And uh, these sons were out in this field, and he was attacked by the Indians. And Lincoln's father was the youngest, and his brothers protected him. And uh, there was one of the brothers killed, as far as I recall, and I'm wondering how history's line would be affected if uh, Lincoln's father was one of the casualties. Edna Medford. Yet the family does start out um, from England to Massachusetts to Pennsylvania to Virginia, Rockingham County, uh, Virginia. And uh, part of the family does end up in Kentucky. What happened was when the father died, there were three sons, but during that period, the oldest son inherited everything. And as a consequence, uh, Lincoln's father, being the youngest, really had to make his way on his own. And so a family that was fairly prosperous, uh, that particular branch of the family, uh, had to struggle a little bit more. Uh, if Lincoln's father had been, the, had been killed early on, who knows um, if Lincoln, if, if the man that we know as Lincoln would have existed. Certainly his relationship with his father uh, was very interesting and uh, very complex as well. And what he becomes is very much in part a reaction to who he felt his father was and his attempt to better himself. If you've just joined us, this is the 16th in a series of 41 programs devoted to American presidents over a 41-week period. We are in Springfield, Illinois. One of the main purposes of all this is for education, and we have done a lot of things for teachers free of charge, and we'll give you the telephone number to call if you want to call our education department and become involved. We'll send you the, uh, all the information. There's still more material to come out as the year goes on, and the telephone number is 202-626-4858. There is someone there right now to uh, take your call, or if it's on um, a videotape replay later on, you can just call the number and leave a message, and folks will call you back. Those are for classroom teachers only at 202-626-4858 and at cspan.org slash classroom. We've had a lot of involvement, and there's still plenty of time in this series to uh, join in on all this, and especially getting ready for the fall. There'll be videotapes available, websites, lesson plans, 202-626-4858. And we're running out of time. We only have a little bit more than 10 minutes. We go next to Everson, Washington. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Yes, my name is Linda Lovison, and my question is very short and simple. I was raised with the picture that Abraham Lincoln taught himself to read sitting by a fireside. Is this true? And also... Is it true that he taught himself to read by reading the Bible? Okay. Thanks. And uh, you forgot to add one important part of all this. He was doing this all when he was in the state of Indiana, I believe. Uh, David Long, is that correct? <laughs> yes. Uh, Lincoln had uh, probably in, in his lifetime uh, maybe the equivalent of a to one year of education. So he did learn in, in, in school uh, some basics, uh, some rudimentary reading and writing, and, and as he put it, ciphering to the rule of three. Uh, so he had a, at least 
uh, education got started with him. Uh, after that, uh, most of it would be done by himself. The fact that he has become one of the great literary stylists in American history is the remarkable thing when you consider the lack of formal education. Colm Davis, have you read all of the legal material that um, is in this series that's going to be released next year? I have not personally inspected every single document of the 100,000 or so, but I've inspected a lot of them. And my colleagues, uh, some seven historians working with me, have in fact carefully inspected those documents in order to be able to write the case descriptions that are a major feature of the product that we're going to publish. Tom Swartz, who is an Illinois State historian and we've done a lot with over the years, not with us this morning live, but for those watching this program live, there will be a chat room at uh, the end of this program with Tom Swartz. And we'll, we've seen a lot of him in the past and we'll see a lot of him in the future. There are just so many people involved in the whole Lincoln story. It was impossible for us to get everybody involved in this one three-hour program. We have another call from Springfield, Illinois, right here in this city where we are. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Joel. I am. Uh... I've always heard a couple of myths about Abraham Lincoln. I thought Mr. Cullum Davis could probably uh, answer, or some of the other historians. One was that during the 1860 election, after uh, very late at night, about midnight, when the final election returns came through, that Lincoln had been in the telegraph office, which was about two doors down from where Mr. Davis is sitting. He went outside. He didn't say anything. Once he was told he had been elected, he went outside, put his top hat on the, on the ground, did a somersault in the street, picked up the hat, walked home, and told Mary, we're elected. The other thing was is that, uh, Ryan, I appreciate your, your somewhat offbeat questions about the different personalities of the individuals, and specifically about the handshake. It's also my understanding that one of the more famous uh, hands, uh, the sculpture of Lincoln's hands that are available in gift shops around Springfield has one with a stick through it, and that that stick was a result of Lincoln's sculptor wanting to get a, 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 a relatively uh, good cast of the hand. Lincoln had been shaking hands all day and was unable to make a fist, so the sculptor picked up a broomstick out of the kitchen there in the Lincoln home and had him hold the stick, which is why the, of the, um, the two hands, one has a stick and one doesn't. Maybe Mr. Davis can, can verify that as well. Colonel Davis? Well, the, the somersaulting Lincoln on the news of his election is a story that obviously cannot be proven. It's a little hard to imagine that a man who um, treasured his clothing um, and uh, was some six feet four inches tall would have done a somersault, but uh, that's part of the great story of Lincoln. Uh, as to his hand, it is true, in fact, that that uh, cast of his hand around a, a handle was because he had been shaking hands. What the viewers might infer from that story and the one that David Long told about uh, his uh, shaking hands in reception, that Lincoln's musculature was uh, rather modest, but in fact he had enormous upper body arm strength. He could hold a broad axe out, straight out, which was a, uh, an impressive accomplishment. It's just that he shook so many hands that his hand tended to tremble, and whether for a uh, signing or for a casting, it was important to um, recover from that experience. One of the things we haven't even touched on is the Civil War, and I've kind of done it on purpose because once you get into that, you'll never ever talk about anything else, and there's plenty of time to deal with uh, that in other venues. But go to the end of this man's life, uh, Edna Medford. He was 56 years old. He died on April the 15th, 1865. There was a 20-day funeral after that. Why? Well, because so many Americans identified with him. Uh, he was the first martyred president, the first one to be assassinated. And so uh, when, he was, when his body was being returned to Springfield, uh, they went to uh, a lot of the different cities on the way, and it took a long time to get him back home. Did the Negroes, the blacks, the African Americans at that time, and I know those different names have been used since then, were they, did they turn out for the, the funeral procession, the train along the way? Indeed they did. Uh, they, they certainly did identify with him. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why we have the whole um, myth of the great emancipator. It's because at that time it's developing the idea that Lincoln, Lincoln single-handedly freed the slaves. Mm -hmm. And of course African Americans bought into that as well. Uh, not because they believe that eman the Emancipation Proclamation freed all enslaved people, but because they saw him as a symbol, a symbol that eventually they could be included as equal partners in American society. Let's go next to Sonoma, California, above San Francisco. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cold. Uh, my grandmother used to tell me 
that uh, she came from Centralia, Illinois. I'm 76, and uh, and she told me that Lincoln used to come. <laughs> excuse me, to uh, her home um, quite a few Sundays, Sundays and Sundays and Sundays. She would show up and have fried chicken dinner with them, and I was so proud that to think that I could stand up in front of the class and tell them that I had uh, a grandmother that had Abraham Lincoln in their house every Sunday. Oh, I was so proud. And I've been through his home and his uh, uh, tomb and everything so many times when I lived in California, in uh, Illinois, because I'm an Illinois person. And I loved Lincoln. Please don't slaughter him like you're trying to do with this Negro bit and a homosexual, please don't do that. That's horrible about him. It's just horrible to say things like that about him. He was a wonderful man, and I'm so proud to have had my grandmother know him. Thank you very much. Next call, Topeka, Kansas. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, we out here in bloody Kansas are convinced that the Civil War began here, not at Fort Sumter. Because in the 50s, you know, there were um, uh, abolitionists, there were free staters, secessionists, uh, pro-slavery, and there was much killing, bloodshed, thievery. So we're, we're convinced, and, and we wish uh, uh, that more of the historians uh, would uh, recognize. You know, we also here in Kansas produced the first black men uh, to uh, fight in the Civil War. But anyway, uh, so if we could get the historians to look just a little bit further west on occasion. Tom Goodrich, the uh, author, has uh, authored four exceptional books about bloody Kansas. But nonetheless, we certainly do enjoy your series. And the one question that I have is uh, I had been given to understand that uh, Mary Lincoln had a tendency to overspend when she got to the White House in order to uh, furnish and change things around. And I would like your comments. David Long. Um, whenever I teach a course on sectionalism and civil war, the, the part that uh, Kansas plays is very significant. In the 1850s, after the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and, and, and the colors is correct. It's almost like a preview of the Civil War it takes place on the plains of Kansas. As, as pro-slavery settlers from the south and, and, and free soil settlers from the north settle in settlements very close to one another and, and will do battle for a period lasting almost a couple of years. Um, as to what was the second part of the call, I, I wanted to say something as well. What did he? There's a great silence here, and we were listening so intently to what you had to say, we can't remember. <laughs> and we are running out of time, but thanks, caller, very much for, uh, for uh, calling us from Topeka. Before we do run out of time, I want to make sure I mention once again the appreciation we have here for Norm Helmers, who uh, is in charge of this whole Lincoln Historic Site for the National Park Service. And uh, Kim Rosendahl, who we did not thank earlier, and Nikki Stratton, and also, of course, Linda Suits and Tim Townsend, who were on this program earlier in the, uh, in the three hours. And uh, Mark Farkas, along with Marty Dominguez, who are co-producers for this entire series. Marty Dominguez back in Washington, Mark Farkas on the road a lot, and involved with the programming itself. And Brett Betzel, our director here on site with our C-SPAN crew. We go next to San Bemis, California. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Thank you very much. I'm calling with regards to uh, Lincoln's three sons. I believe it was stated earlier in the program that they all died. However, I saw a bi biography on a major network stating that Mary Lincoln uh, quite possibly went insane after Lincoln's assassination and was eventually committed by her son. Um, I was wondering on comments on this. Thank you very much. Talking about Robert Todd Lincoln committing her, Edna Medford? She certainly did have a hard time after his assassination. But of course, her, her sorrow was not over. Her, her um, one son does die in, in 71 as well. And so things were very difficult for her. Robert, her oldest son, does eventually get her committed. Uh, she's released after a while. But uh, it just devastated her that her own son would do that to her. Colm Davis, how um, much did that impact the reason why uh, Robert Todd Lincoln is buried at Arlington Cemetery instead of back here with the rest of the family? 
I can't speak to that, uh, frankly, Brian, but uh, it is true that her mental condition deteriorated over time. You don't take a static picture of that relationship between the two of them. Uh, her uh, losing three sons and a husband in the form of, that it occurred, and then having money problems and being accused of having Confederate sympathies inevitably affected her mental uh, ability. Last call, Cookville, Tennessee, you're next. Hello there. Hi. Uh, how are you doing today? We're doing well. How are you? And what would you like to comment on? I'm the last caller. Uh, there's a place in Jackson County, Tennessee, that says that uh, the Lincoln, uh, the Lincoln's parent, Mr. Lincoln's parents, were born there. Uh, do any of you have an, any knowledge of that? And I'll Jackson County, Tennessee, Lincoln's parents, David Long, you're shaking your head. Not to my knowledge. <laughs> Let me ask the three of you before we say goodbye. What was your PhD in, David Long? Uh, United States history, emphasis on the mid 19th century. And you got your uh, PhD at what school? Florida State University. And Edna Medford, what was yours? Mm -hmm. American history with an emphasis on African American history and 19th century South. Colum Davis? American political history at the University of Illinois. Now, we've talked a lot about Abraham Lincoln, a lot of positive about him. Is, uh, is there one thing that you did not like about him? Let's go around the horn one more time, uh, and I'll start with Edna Medford. What did you not like about Abraham Lincoln? Oh, gosh, we don't have enough time. <laughs> no. I, I felt that he moved too slowly in um, pressing for emancipation during the war. I think Benjamin Corliss was right. He led from behind. Uh, I, I do have a problem with his colonization schemes early on. I certainly recognize that he grew while he was president. But certainly when he started out, um, he, he was not a president that would have been acceptable to African Americans during that period, and he was not. By the end of the war, certainly they're changing their opinion of him. Colin Davis? Well, I would uh, largely agree, a, a tendency toward passivity and temporizing on fundamentally explosive issues in American uh, society. But again, as in all these matters, he had a capacity to learn and grow and develop so that the ultimate judgment of him is one that is, I think, um, unequivocally uh, favorable. And David Long? Um, I would agree wholeheartedly with Edna that this is a man who grew. This is a man who by the end of the war, and especially given the experience the last year and a half or so of the war, had, uh, had become a, a, a towering figure. Uh, it would be the young Lincoln that I would probably find more fault with than, than at any other time in his life. There was, uh, he and Mary, one, at one time before they were married, when they were involved in Springfield politics, wrote a letter to the editor, apparently wrote a letter to the editor, a very mean-spirited letter about a, a, an opposing politician, uh, which almost led to a duel um, uh, taking place. And... But I think that Lincoln learned from that experience that, you know, words can be cruel and have an effect and that people, uh, you, can, you can hurt people by how you treat them and what you say. And uh, as I say, I would, it would probably be Lincoln of that earlier generation that I would find the most fault with. David Long teaches at East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. Edna Medford teaches at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and Cullum Davis is the director of the Lincoln Legal Papers and is originally from Peoria, Illinois, Edna Medford originally from Charles City, Virginia, and David Long, Middletown, Ohio. Thank you all very much for joining us today here in Springfield. Next stop, July 9th, which is Greenville, Tennessee, and the home and the tailor shop of Andrew Johnson. Good day.